morning and welcome to the 21st meeting of the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Affairs Committee and our 11th remote meeting. I welcome Stuart Stevenson, MSP, to the committee, uh, who has replaced Stuart McMillan, MSP, as a member of the committee. Stuart McMillan is, however, joining us at his request for the first agenda item in the meeting. I invite Stuart Stevenson to state whether he has any interests uh, relevant to the committee which he wishes to declare. Mr. Stevenson. Uh, thank you, uh, convener. I have uh, nothing in my register of interest, but I do draw members' attention to my postgraduate qualification, which means I am a regular and uh, intensive customer of the National Records of Scotland. Uh, thank you very much for, for that, Mr Stevenson. That is noted. Our first agenda item is evidence on the Committee's commissioned external research on checks on goods imported into the European Union. And can I welcome to the meeting the author of the external research, Anna Yerjevska, a uh, customs and trade consultant. Dr Yerjevska is a globally recognised customs and international trade policy specialist with a com combination of extensive theoretical knowledge and years of practical experience in delivering solutions uh, for real firms facing real problems with regards to customs. Anna has worked as a customs consultant for three of the big four advisory firms, PwC, EY and KPMG in London, where she advised clients on a wide range of global trade and customs issues. In recent years, her main reoccurring clientele have been the United Nations International Trade Centre, British Chambers of Commerce and assorted private sector firms and governments. She is an Associate Fellow of the UK Trade Policy Observatory. Before we hear from Anna, I would like to remind members to give broadcasting staff a few seconds to operate your microphones before beginning to ask your question or to provide an answer if you are a witness. And I would be grateful if questions and answers could be kept as succinct as possible. If we have time at the end, I shall bring members back uh, for supplementaries, but I would ask members to restrict themselves uh, to two questions on this occasion. Before we move to questions, I would like to invite Anna to make a brief opening statement of around two or three minutes. Anna. Good morning. Thank you very much. I hope you can, uh, you can hear me. Uh, well, um, uh, good morning, and then thank you for taking the time to read the report and, and organize the session today. I just wanted to uh, very formally acknowledge my colleagues who helped with the report. While um, I authored the report, uh, as you can obviously appreciate, it covers customs, it covers SPS and technical barriers to trade, and, and as a result, it's a cross, um, um, cross area report in, in many ways. And I wouldn't be able to, um, to write this report without the help of two consultants that, that um, contributed to this report. This is Emily Rees on um, SPS measures and uh, Dr. Peter Holmes on uh, technical barriers to trade. Uh, they both, they, they are not here today, obviously, but they both very kindly agreed to provide any additional um, information or answer your questions in writing should there be a need. Uh, if there's anything that exceeds the, the report in, in these two areas, they'll be happy to help um, after this session. Th thank you very much, Anna. That was very succinct, so that's, uh, that's great. Um, we'll now move to questions. Uh, I will begin with the first questions and then be followed by Claire Baker. Um, your research outlines in great detail some of the trade barriers we would face under WTO agreements and even under free trade agreements such as those of Canada or Japan or association agreements such as the Ukraine has with the EU. Uh, of course, it looks extremely unlikely that the UK will achieve a free trade agreement. Um, so we're just uh, focusing, I'm focusing in my questions on uh, WTO arrangements. Um, now, I've just been reading through some of the documentation that are required just in terms of the customs declaration alone, uh, which you mention in the EU is a document called the SAD. And I was astonished to find there's 50 data fields on the customs declaration. 
um, everything from commodity codes, agents, details, where the goods were shipped from, um, type of customs procedures the goods, the goods are entered into. Um, but there are other forms as well as that one form, you say. So there's transportation documentation, a packing list licenses, transit documents, certificates of preferential origin, and, and, and so it goes on. And you mentioned that it's not an exhaustive list. I have to say I was absolutely exhausted just reading it. And that's obviously before we look at those other checks um, that you talked about in terms of phytosanitary and regulations. I think some of this will come as a surprise to many people who perhaps voted for Brexit, believing it would reduce the burden of red tape. Do you think um, the, the, the burden of red tape and bureaucracy is going to be considerable on business after we leave the EU? Um, well, that's obviously a big question. Um, in terms of red tape, um, I guess I guess you can you can you can kind of look at it in two different ways. You have the red tape in terms of uh, kind of behind the border regulation, and then you have, as you mentioned, border regulation. And you're absolutely right in terms of borders. Uh, Brexit definitely increases uh, the amount of red tape because at the moment we don't have internal borders. Some of the documents that I mentioned in the report are still necessary when you're moving goods within the EU. So you'd normally goods moving within the EU at the moment would still normally be accompanied by some paperwork like transport documentation or uh, commercial invoice. Some of this documentation is, is just standard and, and kind of accompanies any good that moves even, even within the EU. But a lot of it, as you, as you correctly mentioned, will be new. And customs declarations, even though it's just one form and even though uh, on the face of it is just uh, one, one pager, one, one, one page of, of, a, of a document uh, that's um, submitted several times, uh, the amount of time and information that, go, that, in, that goes into preparing a customs declaration is quite significant for any business. And in addition, we have obviously other forms, other checks, other uh, requirements. So there will be quite a significant amount of additional work uh, that comes with, with having a new customs and regulatory border. And that's, again, that's, I think, um, perhaps you're right that it might take some people by surprise. I think we've... Um, uh, we've, you know, in a way, we've forgotten what it's like to trade under WTO rules just because we've been a member of the EU for such a long time. But it's definitely there's definitely a reason that countries enter these arrangements, whether it's uh, a customs union, or FDA, or particularly something like like the EU, which is quite unique in in its form. And as you've uh, also uh, pointed out, uh, the report um, also points to the fact that even having, even if we do manage to have a, a free trade agreement, even if we were aiming for, for a customs union, that wouldn't necessarily um, limit the amount of paperwork at the border. So having a new customs and regulatory border will definitely increase the amount of red tape, and that's something that um, perhaps has not been fully uh, conveyed um, at the time. Sure. Well, thank, thanks very much for that. That's very helpful. Um, one of the people we did speak to recently about uh, about customs and regulations in committee uh, was Michael Gove, the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, uh, who gave evidence to the committee in June this year. Um, and I asked him uh, about the possibility of checks between the UK and Northern Ireland. Uh, the, the port in uh, Cairn Ryan. Um, and Michael Gove were, at that time was quite adamant that if, and he said, if goods are bound for the public of Ireland, uh, customs procedures will be conducted, he said, but we believe that they can be conducted electronically as the goods make their way there. However, the overwhelming majority of trade between uh, the UK and Northern Ireland is intra UK. And he said that the protocol would safeguard the Good Friday Agreement and ensure that there is unfettered access for goods that are circulating in the United Kingdom and Northern Ireland, um, and it would enable provisions to ensure that there was no physical infrastructure at the border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. Indeed, no physical infrastructure, he said, here um, uh, in the UK and South West Scotland. Now, um, why do you think he said that, given that the Prime Minister has now admitted that he's willing to break the law because there is going to be physical infrastructure because of the protocol? 
Well, I can't comment on why um, he, he said that. There's definitely quite a lot in this response. Uh, there's quite a lot of points. Uh, I think the key one is the fact that we cannot at this point determine uh, which goods are going to Northern Ireland and which goods are at risk of going into the Republic of Ireland. That's one of the things that the Joint Committee under the protocol was supposed to uh, agree on and establish a way to, to determine that. Um, that hasn't been done. That's something that the, that the Joint Committee postponed until this autumn. Um, it's, it's a difficult technical issue. It's something that doesn't exist anywhere else. It's a, it, it will have to be a new procedure or a new way of, of, of dealing with um, goods coming through uh, a port, an import and export. Uh, so that's one, one of the things that at, the point, at this point we don't have any, any way and any facility to, to determine uh, where the goods are um, bound to and what's, what's, what's the risk. So saying that goods that are not at risk of moving into no, the Republic of Ireland will not be subject to certain procedures is, is, is quite um, uh, difficult at the moment because we don't have a way to determine that. That's one thing. The second thing is around checks and, and requirements and these requirements being submitted electronically. The fact that customs procedures uh, will be done electronically doesn't in any way um, facilitate um, trade. Uh, I mean, in, in a way it does, but basically what I'm trying to say is that the majority of, uh, if, if not all, customs procedures are already done electronically. That's, that's not, that the, the kind of the way how you submit these forms is not the problem. The problem is that, as, as you mentioned, all the data fields, the information that needs to be gathered and so on. And again, coming back to the whole no checks uh, for movements from GB to NI, I think that's one of the misconceptions. That's something that's been discussed quite a lot. And whenever you hear, um, in the past, Boris Johnson mentioned several times that there will be no checks. And again, checks, and I mentioned this in the report as well, checks and requirements are two different things. Just because checks are not necessarily conducted or checks are conducted only on high-risk goods or a very limited percentage of, of movements doesn't mean that it makes it any more, any, any more um, any easier for, for traders. It's the requirements and the documentary requirements, the, the forms, the, the kind of uh, the, 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 all the work that traders need to do before they export goods, that is the burden, that it makes the difference. There's okay. quite a lot just of very, very response. It, it, yeah. Yeah. But, but just very, very quickly, I mean, you say that, yeah, there is there are more requirements, but given that some of them will be fulfilled electronically, will there still be need for some physical infrastructure? I mean, will there be some delay? The border? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's always, yeah. that's a, I think that's also an important point to make. We, we don't have borders of our infrastructure. That does not exist. You, you always have infrastructure. You have, because when you have, when you have, um, if you have any checks, you, you need, you need people to, to conduct them. You need people to check yes. the forms. You need people to, to check the goods. You need, you need a place to, a place to do that. You need, to, if you have a good that, uh, or a truck that you consider high risk or suspicious, you need somewhere to kind of stop the truck that doesn't stop the flow of traffic and examine it, look at the document and so on. So there's always infrastructure. I think the key phrase mentioned by both, uh, Goff and, and Boris Johnson was no new infrastructure. I think that was in the com command paper on Northern Ireland where the UK uh, outlined its understanding of how uh, this will be implemented. The, the, the phrase was new, no new infrastructure, which obviously we don't necessarily know what that means. If you already have a port, what constitutes new infrastructure? If you add staff and additional desks and, and uh, perhaps expand on the building, is that new infrastructure or is that existing infrastructure? So I think that's that's where the, the kind of, um, <laughs> that's where the details, um, that's where the devil is in the details, isn't it? It's, it's what, what is new infrastructure? Thank you very much. That's very interesting. I'll uh, now move on to Claire Baker. Um, uh, thank you, convener. Uh, I was interested in the report that we were given, the other examples of EU trading relationships. And I had a couple of questions. I suppose that what would be the key thing you think we could learn from other countries' trading agreements they've made with the EU? And it did appear, looking through, that they do develop over time. There'll be um, additional mechanisms or simplifications that are added in. Do you think there's scope for that to happen with a relationship with the UK? That our starting point might not be where we are in six months' time, a year, a year's time. Uh, thank you. I'll start with the with the second question, perhaps. Um, 
yes, uh, relationships develop. Uh, additional agreements, supplementary agreements uh, can be added. Uh, if you look at the number of trade agreements, a lot of them uh, leave um, a provision or include a provisional, leave the doors open for additional negotiations, additional consultations, and additional simplifications in, in the future. So if we do end up having a, a, a deal, which would be a free trade agreement type of deal, uh, it will very likely include provisions for additional cooperation, uh, joint committees, joint uh, cooperation, and so on. So that could happen over time. With no deal, in a no deal scenario, there's also an option for that. Um, a deal could be kind of, in, in a smaller um, sense, could be could be agreed on, for example, mutual recognition or, or so on going forward. Um, so, so there is this possibility. I think with any deal, the question or the, the most important part of the of the of the process is uh, political will on on both sides. Uh, obviously, if we end up with a no deal scenario, the question is how soon will parties be ready to come back to the negotiating table and restart the process? Uh, and uh, I guess to a certain extent, this will depend on at what in what on what terms they will leave that negotiation process at the moment. We obviously have a bit of a um, difficult situation, uh, but but we still have some time to 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 perhaps uh, reach a compromise. So that's an answer to your first question. To your second question, in terms of the first question, I think what's uh, from, from my perspective, the first thing that I'd like to get across, and I, I think that's, that's still not fully understood, is that whatever we do now, whatever, whether we have a deal or we don't have a deal, and we end up in a no-deal scenario, we will have a new border in place. And that, if, if, you, if you read the report, the differences, there are significant differences between different scenarios, whether it's a FTA, a customs union, or a WTO arrangement. But the differences, while they are significant in, in some areas, overall are not that great. If you have a border, you will have requirements at the border, you will have additional paperwork. Um, and in, in particular in my area, in customs, the differences are quite small. So whether we have a deal or not, we will have customs declarations. Whether we have a deal or not, we will have perhaps pre-notifications as well. Uh, so I think that's that's one of the most important parts is that the ch changes are coming whether whether we end up with a deal or or not. Uh, another part, um, um, another part, probably worth mentioning is that there there are various elements as and again and there, uh, there, I think it's explained in the report in in, in detail um, in terms of these three areas so customs, uh, SPS requirements and TBT requirements, technical barriers to trade. Uh, there are very, um, these are three very different areas and not all agreements cover them to the certain, certain extent. So just because we have an agreement, just if we, if we end up having a, a free trade agreement, doesn't necessarily mean that there's a set, uh, type of an agreement. It will, we would still need to see what's in that agreement to know what's going to happen at the border. That makes sense. So, and uh, having a deal, a deal is not a, a kind of a, a set in stone. A deal will still, vary depending on what's agreed between the parties. Um, th thank you. If um, So once, depending on what deal there is, that there will be some kind of border and there'll be checks and balances, there'll be additional bureaucracy. How do you think that would impact on the type of goods that the UK trades with Europe? Is there a significant difference between what we currently trade and what other countries who are in different, I mean, who aren't part of a single market and the customs union? What type of things that they trade? Do you think it would make a difference to our markets? I think that's a very difficult question for me to answer. Um, over the last four years, um, speaking to companies and speaking to traders, um, I've heard from a number of companies that, that because of even not necessarily um, the final outcome, but the current uncertainty or the uncertainty that we've witnessed over the last four years, they have been losing clients in the EU, and that's not necessarily um, that's not necessarily in terms of, um, as I mentioned, the, the new customs and regulatory border that's going to be implemented. It's more around that if you are a um, if you're a company based in the EU and you hear about Brexit and you know this is going on and you don't necessarily know what's going to happen and you have a supplier in a neighboring member state that sells goods that are of equivalent uh, quality, 
you might not want to deal with the additional uncertainty. I think that might be quite similar after Brexit, whatever the outcome is. Uh, even if there are no tariffs, because we'll end up having a free trade agreement, we will still have additional costs of moving goods between the UK and the EU because of customs procedures, because of other admin and, and, and regulatory requirements. So this additional cost, again, if you have a long-term relationship with your supplier in the EU and it's a good relationship and the products you provide are of, uh, of a quality that perhaps is you know, difficult to find somewhere else, that might continue, uh, that relationship might continue. If, if in some cases it won't continue, in some cases EU suppliers will find alternative sources closer to home. Uh, so I think, it's, I think it's very difficult to say what the long-term impact will be. A number of countries trade on, on WTO uh, rules. It's not obviously impossible. It just makes things uh, slightly more expensive and uh, slightly more time-consuming. And again, I think there will be also a, a bit of learning curve in terms of um, how companies on both sides will adjust to the, to the change. I think over time, it might be that companies in the UK will find a way to be more competitive. And, and make their products attractive in, on, on the EU market uh, despite the additional costs. But it's, it's very difficult to, to comment on the kind of composition of, of trade after Brexit. Thank you. Thank you very much. We now move to questions from Annabel Ewing, followed by Oliver Mundell. Thank you, uh, convener, uh, and good morning to our witness, uh, and thank you very much indeed for coming in. Um, sticking with the, um, the issue of the impact on trade, I wonder specifically um, what your thoughts would be on um, the impact of the, the regime, whatever it is, and it's looking increasingly like uh, it's uh, WTO uh, as of the 1st of January 2021. What, what is it like to impact on the physical movement of goods? In that regard, I think there was a, a reference the other day to a, a UK government document which suggested that there could be these massive lorry parks in Kent with lorries queuing for two days and thousands upon thousands of lorries queuing up. And I just wonder, in, in terms of the, um, the work that you've been doing, is that something that, that business is, is kind of just accepting now, that that's how trade is to continue from the 1st of January next year? Yes, thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, it, it, again, it's, it's a big question in, in, in a way. I think to start with, it, it, will, be, it will be worth um, mentioning that we don't necessarily we don't necessarily know how things are going to work at the border. Uh, in a recent uh, select committee, I, I've been asked to provide uh, a percentage of in terms of how certain I am that there will be chaos in Kent, and I think I've given 70 to 80 percent. However, it's it's quite difficult to predict. The reason for that is a border is, is a very kind of complex um, process. There's a number of parties that need to be ready. And again, in order for everything to work smoothly, you have, you have the government with its new IT system and new processes and new guidance and so on. So the government needs to provide the information that it needs to provide on time with enough time for traders and any other operators to familiarize themselves with uh, this information and, and implement it. Then you have whole years and customs brokers. And we know that there's an issue there in terms of lack of, um, sufficient amounts of customs brokers, and, and there might be shortages in, in, that res, in that respect. We also have port operators that have their own IT systems and their own processes, and they need to be ready, they need to have enough information, and they, their IT systems need to learn and need to connect to uh, government's IT systems. And then obviously you have traders who will need to provide um, information to, to all the other parties and so on. So there's a number of players and a number of IT systems. Some of these IT systems do not currently exist. Um, we don't necessarily have visibility of the full operating model. We have a, a kind of a, an initial version of the full operating model. We are waiting for the further information. But it's all, I think the biggest worry here is that it's all being done last minute. I think that's the main reason why we are expecting difficulties is that it's not 
it's not impossible to make this work. I think that the, the difficulty is how late um, in, in the year we're, we're kind of we're leaving this until. I think if we get information in November, as it's looking a bit more likely that we'll get full information in November of all the guidance and so on, that leaves companies and all the other players very little time to prepare, which makes it very uh, likely that in places like Dover, and especially in the in the ports where the rural ports, the ports where we have um, very little time to um, conduct any checks or or uh, very little space in terms of physical space in the port, there will be uh, bottlenecks, there will be uh, lines, there will be difficulties. Uh, because of, of, of the kind of initial chaos and, and uncertainty as, as, as to what, what all parties should be, uh, should, uh, should do. I think over time, this will, uh, this will change. Um, I think over time, companies and hauliers and ports will find a way to operate uh, and will, will figure it out. But initially, uh, there might be, uh, difficulties because of lack of information and because of the fact that we're not prepared and we, probably should have uh, had a bit more information earlier on in the year to, to leave ourselves more time. Thank you for that. Um, you, men you mentioned IT systems, and I understand that there was a, a, a report uh, in the press this week that the UK government's IT system, which I think is called Smart Freight Web Service, um, is to go online operational from first January. However, it has not been beta tested, and I have checked. I'm not a computer person. What beta testing means, and it means no. any form of the final testing of a product before it goes to market. So they don't expect the beta testing to be completed uh, uh, until at least April. Though, of course, that could be put back. So that would mean, therefore, that you would have an untested IT system supposed to deal with billions of pounds worth of trade. Going live from the first of January 21, that doesn't seem to me to be optimal. Uh, yes, absolutely, it's it's not optimal, and I think it's it's worth pointing out that the system you mentioned um, was designed as a um, backup option for the system that was originally going to be used GVMS, Good Vehicles Movement System, which was supposed to be the, 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 kind of the main system as of the 1st of January, because it was at some point the government realized that it will not be ready uh, in its full um, capability and functionality on the 1st of January. As a backup system, as a fallback uh, option, this new other system uh, was, was designed, which probably, if you don't have time to develop one IT system, uh, setting as other IT system as a backup uh, option is probably not the best way to go. Um, but yeah, this, this system was, was as a backup option, and its key function, um, coming back to your earlier question, was managing traffic in particular in Kent, because that's one of the, uh, one of the areas where we know in terms of volumes of, of trucks and goods moving, that, that will be the, the high risk area in terms of bottlenecks, uh, queues and so on. So the key point of the system was on the way out of the UK, so exports to the EU, where we don't have any simplifications from the 1st of January, where full procedures will operate from the 1st of January to manage um, trucks to manage movement of goods, to make sure that companies or trucks that aren't ready, that don't have the necessary paperwork, do not proceed to can, do not end up uh, at the port without without paperwork, uh, and then have to be parked somewhere and have to have to be given help and or have to be turned back and so on. So that was the point of the system. Uh, without that uh, system ready, um, there will have to be some other fallback um, uh, systems or, or, or ways to deal with traffic and to deal with, with that outgoing um, leg of the journey. Because on the import side, we have the simplifications that UK government introduced that might uh, and are very likely to, to help in terms of managing the inbound traffic, but the outbound part of the journey is where we have problems at the moment. And again, without this IT system, uh, I'm not entirely sure what, what procedures. I mean, we have the uh, bar procedure, um, operation bar that might be, uh, again, a way to do it, but um, but yeah, that, that's definitely definitely not not helpful. We were we were hoping that the system will be ready for the first of January. Well, it's all very uh, gloomy. And if if this um, smart freight uh, IT system was the backup to the first system that, that could get to work, and this system hasn't been tested, 
it's very difficult to see um, what could be done between now and the 1st of January 2021 in terms of a third option. Uh, and I just wonder, in my last question, convener, if I may, um, you know, obviously at the moment we have frictionless trade in the single market customs union. Um, it, 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 whatever happens, we will not be having frictionless trade of the single market and the customs union. And I would imagine that even in the, the medium to longer term, that will still be a very different way for businesses to operate. And I just wonder to what extent, you know, they 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 are able to plan for that, particularly taking into account that we're in the midst of a global pandemic, where you know there are severe restrictions on normal business. Um, I just wonder, in terms of your experience, how optimistic are businesses about the the possibility of trade resembling anywhere near what they can do at the moment, which is to trade freely across a market of five hundred million people. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, absolutely, uh, we will not have a frictionless trade. There's no such thing as frictionless trade outside of the um, single market and the customs union. Um, that's, I mean, the EU is the highest form of uh, economic integration, and, and that's what we get as a result. Uh, outside, we'll always have some sort of a friction, as all borders do. In terms of trader readiness, it's, it's, and again, it's a complex question because on one hand. Uh, there is this notion that companies had four years to prepare. Uh, on the other hand, when you speak to companies, that's a completely different story. Uh, for the majority of this time, uh, there was great uncertainty. And um, for a company um, under under such pressure, uh, I mean, I think companies in general have been put in a very difficult situation here, uh, because preparing for something that you're not necessarily sure what is going to look like uh, is quite difficult. And for a company to be able to prepare it's not the high level information that it needs. It doesn't need to necessarily know whether it's going to be a customs union or an FDA. It needs the operating details. It needs the, needs the tariffs. It needs all the technical uh, details and regulation in its specific area. So, for example, if the company is uh, in a pharma industry, it needs to see what the regulation and provisions will be for the something as highly regulated as, as the pharma industry. The same for producers of food and, uh, and animal products. They need all the details to be able to prepare and to really understand what the impact on them will be. And we only got uh, tariffs, uh, in EU's, uh, sorry, UK's external tariffs, uh, I think in, it was May, which was still quite early given that last time I think we got it two or three weeks in advance uh, before the deadline. And we're still not entirely sure whether these are the final tariffs. So for companies, and, and we have uh, we have companies, or I have companies that I speak to that that are about to uh, make orders, uh, have goods shipped from from all different parts of the world, and in several in, in certain cases, just the shipping process take, takes several weeks. So if we have again coming back to this readiness point, if we have full information by December, the goods are already en route, the goods are already being shipped. So as we had twice already with the previous deadlines, we have a situation where uh, traders are ordering goods or purchasing goods without knowing under which conditions and which tr uh, trading terms these goods will arrive in the UK, which is a completely unprecedented situation and, and not really a situation that uh, any business should be in. Um, so that, that's, I guess that's one, uh, one part of it. Coming back to what you said about the pandemic, I think, again, a number of businesses uh, left their Brexit readiness preparations um, until, the 2020, uh, until 2020. We've got some sort of, um, perhaps not certainty, but some sort of um, clarity with the withdrawal agreement, or just towards the end of last year. And then, obviously, we actually left <laughs> earlier this year. And from, I think, a number of businesses waited until this moment to start their, their uh, start looking at, at what they can do to prepare and, and getting themselves ready. Obviously, unfortunately, this was the moment when the pandemic hit and businesses were completely side sidelined and, and, um, with, 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 uh, with COVID-19. Um, now, with the time that we have left, we not only have a potential second wave uh, and the impact that that might have on businesses that I in, in many cases, already struggling and have staff that uh, for local or, or staff that have been let go. Um, we have 
potential impact of, of Brexit, even a no-deal Brexit. And then, as a number of um, people in supply chain and, and retail pointed out, we also have Christmas, which is the busiest time yeah. for, for any retailer. And, and um, so, so these three, it's, it's not, even a, not, not even a double whammy. It's, it's a triple effect. You have the worst possible moment for businesses for any significant change. Uh, with uh, the majority of staff and, and in, in, in many businesses uh, from mid-December, I mean, everyone's on a holiday anyway. It's, it's a bit of a strange period. And to have the information kind of published and, and, uh, and a deal perhaps uh, reached in the very last minute with the pandemic and with uh, Christmas um, um, madness in, in, in a way in terms of retail, uh, that's going to be incredibly difficult. Uh, and, and businesses, I mean, they're optimistic. Uh, and again, it's very difficult to say whether businesses are optimistic or not. I think long term, it, 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 there will definitely be uh, issues. But I think at the moment, businesses are focusing on the short term difficulties. And I think the short term will be will be very difficult. There will be long term impact, and I'm not by any means um, trying to to sound like this is not important, but I, I think that the struggle will be the short term, the first couple of weeks or months. Uh, that, that's going okay. to be quite difficult. Thanks. Thanks very much. We'll need to move on to our next member. Thank you. Um, Oliver Mundell. I, I apologize. I'm not able to hear the question. Yeah, Oliver, the could you repeat it? Oliver, you, you seem to have been muted there, Oliver. Do you mind repeating your question? Oliver's still muted, I'm afraid. I think I may need to go to another member until we've got Oliver's sound sorted out. Um, so I think if I could move on to Beatrice Wishard until we've sorted out all of her sound. Beatrice? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, convener. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes. Can you hear yes. me? Yeah. yeah. Just to make sure before yeah. we say before we uh, um, good morning, Anna. Thank you for your very helpful um, report. Um, and actually, in just following on uh, Ms. Ewing's questionings, I mean, we seem to be heading for a perfect storm um, on the 1st of January. And, and you've also mentioned losing, you know, clients are losing business in the UK over the last four years. And we know that one of the things that business doesn't like is uncertainty. Um, I wonder if you could give me a bit more um, information about uh, what sectors you envisage um, in the Scottish economy that are most likely to be impacted, um, particularly on, on checks on goods that are going into the EU. Um, I'm, I'm particularly interested in perishable, perishable goods in terms of fishing and aquaculture. Yeah, I think I think that's exactly the answer uh, an answer to your question in, in a way. Uh, uh, one of the goods that uh, I, I mean it, again, it's difficult to to uh, assess what will be impacted and what not. But one of the areas, one of the sectors that is particularly at risk uh, would be uh, food and animal products, um, um, fishing sector, and and that that I think that will be an issue, particularly given how many small and medium size uh, companies are involved. How many of these producers are not necessarily large multinational companies, but but small uh, small producers? And I think that um, for them, the impact of additional paperwork, especially something as SPS requirement, which is so um, uh, complex and so um, it requires so much work in advance, obtaining a certificate or, or making sure you comply with all the regulations. Even there, there's there, that's I think that's incredibly. Um, this is an incredibly uh, burdensome requirement for companies that that have never had to de deal with it before. Uh, so I think that will be an issue. And again, uh, um, I've had conversations where, whereby there's a, this uncertainty regarding well, what if a, a if a truck is um, sent from Scotland all the way down to to to, to, to the south um, and it's turned back, 
what's what happens then if there's not the, the documentation isn't sufficient uh, sufficient what 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 happens then uh, i think this is a serious concern i think there there's a need for some sort of um regional support or additional support for companies especially uh, as i mentioned small and medium sized companies the family run businesses uh, because these requirements you know they are incredibly technical and um, it's not a question of reading the guidance and and going all right well that's what i need to do or these these are the forms that i need to uh, fulfill uh, so, uh, fill in uh, you need to really understand all your obligations otherwise the truck will be turned back or your, your your shipment will be turned back will not be able to enter the eu these are completely incredibly strict regulations you you have to have everything done on time the right certificates the right checks uh for for your type of product it's not necessarily uh, the other problem is that it's not necessarily the same for different types of uh, products so uh one exporter in scotland might be subject to different regulations and different requirements than another so it's not even a question of uh, them necessarily learning from from each other if they export different types of products. Um, so so there's definitely a need for for some support here. This this will be um, th this will be an area where where um, there's a significant risk in terms of impact on the Scottish economy. Uh, thank you for that helpful answer. Um, and do you think that um, there are lessons to be learned from other countries uh, in terms of of perishable exports uh, and their, and their borders? Is there anything that that stick that that you can see that would be useful in in our situation? I think again, not necessarily, because the problem we're having, in, particularly in this uh, in this instance, is that we're moving from a degree of higher economic integration to something of a of a lesser nature, in a way, in terms of economic integration, without making any political judgment on on the outcome. Um, so. In, in other countries, if you start exporting or if you start um, if you if you start trading, you are aware of what the requirements are, and you either either conform with these requirements and export abroad, or you don't. We are in a very unique situation whereby overnight something that was never required becomes becomes mandatory. I think one of the lessons um, that that might be useful coming back to this need for for um, uh, additional help is that a number of countries, whether these are uh, developed countries or that also is the case in a number of African countries, for example, the government actively supports exporters of such goods uh, in in uh, helping them understand what these requirements are. So, in a number, for example, in a number of African countries, uh, there are special bodies uh, or special help available to exporters because EU regulation in 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 terms of uh, perishable goods is so strict and is so complex that uh, it's understood that that companies are not necessarily able to do it themselves. So, I think that's, I guess, one of the the lessons that at some point uh, there I mean, there will need to be there will need to be additional help available. Okay, thank you, Anna. Thank you, Convin. Thank you. Yeah, we'll need to move on to the next speaker. I think we have Oliver Mandel's microphone sorted out now. Oliver, are you there? I'm here. Hopefully you can hear me this time, convener. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Thank you. I, I'm sorry if I cut across I, my colleagues' I, questions because I, I didn't know what was just asked I, there. I, but I, I was interested in I, what proportion of businesses export just to the EU at the moment. I mean, obviously, there'll be some businesses in that category, but a lot of other businesses are surely used to at least some uh, customs paperwork from the small amount of trade you know, many of them do with, 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 with uh, other countries around the world at the moment. Um, yes, uh, apologies. I, um, I've had, uh, I think it's, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot the I forgot the number. There's a number, uh, official number of a uh, number of EU businesses um, that that exports uh, that the UK government estimates that exports only to the EU. And apologies, I it's in my mind. I will have to get back to you on this. Um, no, I, I apologies. Uh, I will have to get back to you with a particular number. But th that's definitely an interesting point about the fact that. Some businesses, yes, they are the export to the US, they export to all, all around the world, they're used to customs formalities, customs procedures, and so on. Uh, two points here. One is that um, 
for, for these businesses, it's easier as in the way that they understand what, the, what they need to do to submit a customs declaration. Uh, two points that make it still difficult. One is the availability of, um, of um, um, customs agents and customs brokers. Majority of businesses, very few businesses sub, uh, submit customs declarations themselves. Majority of businesses use an agent, use a, a service provider to do that. Um, because of the, of the increased volume of export declarations, uh, or import declarations as well. There will be shortages of these of these uh, brokers and and service providers available. Uh, as a result, even companies that already export and already are engaged in that process might find it difficult to find the service provider to do that for them. So that's that's one area where it's difficult. Another area where it's difficult is that um, while they would be familiar with with customs declarations. Uh, Obviously, there will be some specific um, uh, specific information in terms of the UK EU relationship that that they need to uh, that they need to add to this uh, mix. And there's, as everyone else, they're still waiting to find out what the details of the arrangement is. So it's not necessarily just because a business exports, let's say, to the US, they're all sorted and they have everything they need for the first of January. That's not necessarily the case. It is easier, but it doesn't mean that uh, that that there, there are no problems there. Thank you for that. Um, the other question I wondered, I mean, obviously you've highlighted Christmas uh, as, as a kind of risk factor, you know, in terms of business preparation. But um, I, I wondered, you know, what, when you felt the better time in the year for that would be, because uh, again, I, mean, I, I could I could be wrong, but for a lot of industries, you know, in, in terms of exports, you know, January, February tend to be quieter times of the year. You know, and, and therefore, you know, it's an easier time to to, to, to manage any short-term you know disruption to, to kind of use the, the, the kind of word that's been been sort of brought up earlier. Is there um, a better time of the year yeah. for that to happen, or? I mean, <laughs> is there a better time of year for a massive change and disruption? <laughs> it's uh, it, it, uh, I think let's let's put it this way that Christmas is probably. Um, not an ideal time, not necessarily sure whether it would be, um, what time would be better. Definitely a, a, a quieter time is, is better. What a lot of companies did last time with the two previous deadlines, uh, there are two things that companies did to, in order to prepare themselves. They are their stockpiled, um, hoping that they will be able to uh, use the provisions, whatever happened if there are uh, any disruptions. And related to this is, in the run-up to whatever the deadline, in the previous deadline was, or two deadlines, uh, they um, uh, they had a period of where where they imported and exported less, so that they had a bit of a quiet period to without orders. So planning ahead, they they weren't uh, um, making additional orders for that particular period in time to make sure that they do have some breathing space to see how the situation uh, develops. Uh, what happens at the border, and if a number of companies do that, that means that there's less in terms of volumes coming through ports for a couple of days up to a week, which gives a little bit of, uh, of an opportunity for uh, port operators, logistics providers, and so on to figure things out, with this being one of the busiest times uh, in terms of uh, retail and, and volumes, this will be difficult. So I mm. think that's just this additional difficulties that you can't you can't uh, companies are not necessarily in a position where they can stop orders for a week or, or bring them down, perhaps not stop entirely, but uh, limit the quantities. Thank you. Okay. And another thing I guess uh, worth mentioning is that, that uh, companies have already, uh, you know, companies that have stockpiled twice and had issues uh, with, with that and had financial investments related to that, um, uh, they, they've already, they've already done this twice. They might also be a bit reluctant to prepare for this, uh, this time as well. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I will now move on to Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you, uh, convener. Uh, let me just uh, pick up uh, Oliver Mandel's first question and develop it a little bit. Um, companies that export to countries outside the EU are, of course, often doing so under the overarching uh, arrangements between the EU and those countries. I, for example, have uh, 
uh, a potato seed potato exporter that I know exports to Uruguay and to the Philippines because I've been involved in uh, helping them with issues there. Um, and they are covered by EU uh, regulations and trade agreements, and therefore the paperwork is known. To what extent uh, are trade between Scottish companies, UK companies for that matter, and and countries around the world where the trade is governed by EU agreements going to be disrupted by uh, what might happen at the end of this year? Uh, yes, that's, that's, uh, that's an important question. Uh, the UK um, currently is still a member of of uh, or a party to a number of trade agreements that the EU has with countries around the world. As of the 1st of January, that will no longer be the case. The UK government has worked on these, uh, on, on extending these provisions or signing these continuity or rollover agreements for, for a number of years. And there have been, uh, some, some, uh, there's been a, a, quite a lot of progress made. There are some, some notable exceptions. Um, such as Canada or Turkey, where these agreements have not yet been signed. We obviously had Japan um, announcement on Japan last week or, or the week before that. Um, and we are it, countries that have not been the agreements that have not been rolled over are still under negotiations. As far as I'm aware, uh, depending on what happens uh, between the UK and the EU, uh, there might be still some agreements rolled over before the end of the year. So then we might still have some, some additional um, opportunities there. Uh, in terms of the impact on Scottish companies and UK companies uh, from a wider perspective of, of, of this change, uh, that very much will depend on, on, on uh, companies. A number of companies that I speak to um, are looking currently at, at their supply chains to understand w whether basically their products will be able to uh, fulfill rules of origin, which will determine whether they're eligible for these um, for these preferential tariffs under these deals. One of the helpful things that the UK government was able to achieve is a certain provision with these trade agreements, meaning that uh, producers in the UK can still use EU inputs and still be eligible for these preferential treatments, uh, preferential tariffs under the under the trade agreements. So for a number of companies, that will be very helpful. They can still export and import under the preferential tariffs. Uh, not for all companies. Some companies will be impacted by the fact that the EU is not part of these um, of these agreements. But I think the biggest impact uh, in that respect will be the other way around almost. So the biggest impact will be on companies that exported, well, not exported because at the moment we don't have export, but supplied EU manufacturers that then send these products to uh, to these uh, trade agreement partners. And I think that's something that's not highlighted enough, and that's not something that we focus on enough. It's not necessarily the UK to the free trade agreement partner movement that will be impacted, but I think there will be a significant impact on the on the companies that supply EU manufacturers um, and, and companies that supply the EU, because the EU will not be using the same provision and will not be counting, counting UK inputs as originating. So I think that's that's something worth mentioning. I don't think that's getting enough attention, perhaps. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, there's also sanitary and psychosanitary uh, issues because the UK will no longer be governed by EU law in that regard. So even if the paperwork side of it might be okay in the tariff side, uh, I'm not sure it uh, facilitates. But I wanted to ask a, a very and try and get a relatively short answer. Uh, you're you're very helpful document to the committee it talks about export of live animals, but essentially seems to focus on mammals. Uh, whereas uh, for many rural areas in Scotland, small communities, is the export of nephrops, of uh, langoustines, lobsters, scallops, uh, prawns, who are live animals as well, yes. and who are absolutely time critical. Uh, Boulogne sur Mer's market, for example, specifically refers to the fact that many Scottish companies uh, trade uh, trade yes. through there. And, and, and how are they going to be placed in getting their goods to uh, to market, where even a delay of six hours leaves the goods dead or valueless? Yes, yes, absolutely. I'm actually uh, uh, in one of my projects. I'm actually looking at, at uh, exports of uh, shrimp from from Scotland. So I'm starting to appreciate the complexity of that supply chain and and um, uh, and, and how time is is important here. Uh, definitely, I think that 
again, it would, it would depend where the where these where these goods are are, are shipped to. Uh, in respect of um, trade with uh, particular third countries, uh, that that relationship is bilateral at this point, as of first of January. So the UK and the particular country, uh, if there are any issues in terms of delay, any uh, documentary requirements, I think to a certain extent the rolling over of these agreements should help. Uh, however, yes, there is a risk of of, of delays, and if you said, uh, as you said, even a couple of hours in that particular example will uh, matter. But the, the silver lining here is that if it's a UK uh, third-party country relationship, then there is scope for bilateral. Um, cooperation to to uh, address any delays, especially if there's a rollover agreement, there's a sort of agreement. So I guess that's just a question of ensuring that the UK uh, deals with these um, issues bilaterally, bilaterally, which uh, obviously so far it didn't have to, but uh, but now it will be up to the UK uh, government to to address these issues. Thank you very much, and I'd like to move on to Dean Lockhart. Thank you very much, convener. And, uh, good morning, Anna. I, I would like to ask about uh, what tariffs would apply if we reach a Canada-style free trade agreement <clears throat> with the EU. Can you clarify what tariffs apply on products traded between Canada and the EU? And I'd like to get your views on whether there are any particular reasons the EU uh, can't agree a Canada-style deal with the UK, because I think you mentioned this earlier. This is actually, I, th I understand, the first time a free trade agreement will be reached when the parties, uh, the EU and the UK, are, are actually already in full regulatory alignment. Thank you. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I'll try to answer this briefly. So, in terms of uh, EU-Canada agreement, the existing Canada agreement, EU-Canada agreement, the CETA, uh, uh, I believe the the, the, the Agreement uh, liber uh, liberalizes about 98 to 99 percent of tariff lines, which means that the majority of tariff lines have been uh, tariffs have been removed and are at zero, providing provided that goods comply with rules of origin and are eligible. Uh, in terms of the UK EU agreement, what tariffs will uh, apply depends on what's what's agreed. Uh, we're expecting this, and I, uh, again, the original plan was to have a tariff-free, quota-free uh, trade deal, which would mean um, again. Probably there would still be some exceptions. There's always some some exceptions. Every agreement, even the the EU Japan, the current UK Japan agreement, even if it says it's 99% of tariffs removed, there's always there are always some exceptions. There are always some products that are that that, that, that still uh, retain tariffs. Uh, but it's if the agreement is reached, it's it's very likely that the majority of tariffs at perhaps 98, 99%. Uh, level would be removed. Uh, which tariffs uh, would be yeah. would remain? Obviously, we we'll, we'll need to to see. Uh, this obviously will be uh, still subject to goods uh, being eligible and fulfilling rules of origin. So that's the first part of your question. In terms of why uh, the UK and the EU cannot agree this deal, I mean, uh, first of all, I'm not entirely sure that I'm still not entirely sure, despite uh, everything that's happened in the last couple of weeks, that uh, we won't have a last-minute deal. I think the stakes are really high on both sides, and I think. Um, at the end of the day, both sides appreciate that the, the deal will be important. Uh, the, as you mentioned, com both sides are um, completely aligned in, uh, uh, until, um, until the 1st of January, uh, perfectly aligned. It's a very new agreement because it's, it's a divorce rather than coming together of two parties. And the reasons that we're having difficulties in uh, in obtaining this agreement have nothing to do with technical questions. This is all uh, political issues. It's all uh, around, um, well, there are obviously a couple of areas such as fisheries, level playing fields, and so uh, level playing field, and so on. Provisions in these areas are difficult to, to, to agree between the parties. But again, the reason why these provisions are difficult have nothing to do with the technical side of that. It's, it's all a question of, of uh, political uh, agreement and, and, and difficulties in that on that front. And the same with customs. There's absolutely no reason why the UK and the EU could not reach an agreement. Technically speaking, uh, it's absolutely uh, doable. Which is why I hope uh, common sense and, and reason will prevail and will, will, reach, will reach an agreement at the end of the day, even if it's a very last minute agreement. Uh, thank you, and uh, that was very helpful. I, I actually share your confidence that, that a, a last-minute deal will be done. It seems to be the nature of trade negotiations that it's left until you know five minutes before the deadline. 
Uh, I'd like to move on to, to ask about the, the joint committee set up to identify goods which are at risk of being exported into the Republic of Ireland. Uh, presumably, you mentioned all the documentation um, exporters have to comply with in terms of export destination you know, and the ability to track the movement of, of goods with, with modern technology. Um, in my mind, it, shouldn't it be relatively easy to identify goods at risk of, of being exported into the Republic of Ireland if parties are acting reasonably? A uh, very good question. Uh, a short answer, not necessarily. Uh, it's a very, um, we've never seen anything like this. Normally, when you come to the border, when the goods arrive at the border, the question is where they've been, where they're coming from, where they're originating. No one asks questions necessarily where they're going. Under certain limited um, amount of cases uh, with certain customs procedures, you it's important to see where the goods end up, but these procedures require uh, a significant amount of documentary evidence from a company. So the burden of, of, uh, of demonstrating where the goods ended up is on the company. I've actually written a, a paper a while back about ways how this could be solved from a technical perspective, and I came up with three different options based on existing procedures, but it seems to me that there's a balance between how certain the government of both sides, so the UK and the EU, want to be how much control and oversight they want to have and how much burden is placed on the company. Because in order to really, uh, for, for both sides to really absolutely have certainty that the goods ended up in Northern Ireland and not in the Republic, you would need to place, uh, uh, you, you would need to require companies to submit a lot of paperwork, as it is with these special procedures that I mentioned, such as inward processing. We then, uh, a company, uh, tariffs are suspended, but the company needs to demonstrate and provide evidence of these goods being then re-exported. And that's a lot of evidence, it's a lot of time, and that's, that's quite a, a strict procedure. So we don't want to end up with something like this because this will absolutely will be incredibly difficult for businesses, will we'll make it uh, even more time consuming and even more expensive to, to trade between GB and NI. So we, we need to find a balance between these two. We need to find a procedure that's um, reasonable, as you mentioned. And, and I think, uh, and again, I, I don't think necessarily that the difficulty here is technical. It is a dif difficult technical topic, but um, reaching a, a solution would require as it's often been said, mutual trust and, and uh, confidence and, and, I guess, cooperation. Uh, and I think that's, that is where we're struggling at the moment, is, is the mutual trust and, and confidence, that, that, that part. Um, yes, so I guess, I guess I'll leave it there. It's, it, it's, it's never been done before. It requires some creative thinking, but, uh, but the big issue is not to, not to make it too strict, otherwise companies won't be able to try. It will be just too difficult. That's very helpful, Anna. And I guess if you have one party demanding 100% certainty of what's going to, of, of tracking the goods, that, that that's going to make the process difficult. But uh, convener, I think I think those are my two questions. Th thanks again, Anna. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dean. And we now move on to Kenneth Gibson. Um, Kenneth, we seem to be having an issue there with your um, with your sound, um, and indeed with your um, with your vision as well. I think we shall move on um, and try to sort you out. But we'll move on now to Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Convener. Uh, good morning, Anna. Uh, Anna, um, I represent a constituency which has a port, and the UK government have spoken uh, of introducing some ten free ports uh, across the UK. Uh, and I, but after reading your paper, uh, just a couple of questions just regarding free ports. Uh, in section four uh, of your paper, where you it's entitled the general border procedures. Um, there's a section there that is called safety and security processes and anti-smuggling procedures. And I was conscious also that uh, earlier on this year, the Guardian had written an article regarding the uh, illegal activity uh, going through free ports 
Do you think that free ports are, uh, are, a, are a possible way forward to actually try to assist uh, with the, the UK actually leaving the European Union? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, yes, free ports are, are very, uh, an interesting topic. A uh, couple of uh, background points. We obviously had free ports in the, free ports in the UK uh, uh, up to, I believe, uh, 2012. Uh, they weren't used. Uh, there are other procedures, uh, customs procedures, that do pretty much the same thing without the need for relocating and being located near a port. So these procedures are more popular than free ports. What the UK government is planning to do now uh, in the, the consultation on free ports and, and the report uh, that came out of these consultations is a mix of a free port procedure in terms of customs and a mix of other incentives, tax incentives, um, uh, support uh, and additional provisions for companies within this free port. So it's not necessarily um, purely a customs procedure. From a customs perspective, free ports, um, I, again, they, they can be a very useful tool, not necessarily, I mean, it's, it's particularly, um, the very successful free ports are located in areas uh, such as Middle East, where um, tax provisions are perhaps slightly uh, more uh, flexible than they would be in the UK. So the biggest provisions or the biggest benefits of free ports uh, that, that we see there might not be able to be replicated uh, in the UK uh, from, a, from a customs perspective. Uh, again, uh, worth mentioning that, that the Freeport actually adds one more customs border because the, the Freeport itself is surrounded by yet another customs border, uh, so it adds even more uh, paperwork in red tape. In terms of um, illegal activities, yes, there, there, there's been a lot uh, in, in the media around it. I mean, I think the EU Commission has issued a report a while back. Uh, this is something that, that it's not a new topic. Uh, these free ports have been known to to be a place where uh, where various activities take place. Uh, uh, a number of um, of uh, Basically, the, the number of people in different disciplines know them for, for different purposes. Uh, for for um, investors, free ports are a fantastic place to store uh, expensive art and, and other uh, exp expensive pieces of investment because of their uh, duty-free nature and, and, and uh, incentives they provide. Um, I guess everything will depend on the amount of controls that are implemented in, in, in the free ports uh, in terms of how much uh, illegal activity is going on. Again, this brings us back to how much red tape, how much additional procedures are involved in a free port. The fact that that a free port requires an oversight, requires uh, additional um, in inspections and, and so on, whether they can be helpful or not. I think a number of, of UK ports have applied or at least are thinking about applying for this free port status. I think in many cases, I'm not saying that they can't be beneficial, but I think in, in many cases, um, uh, ports are expecting um, this to completely change their situation or to completely, I think, I, I think I, there was an article one or two days ago about a port that um, uh, the, the headline said that the free port status is key to survival of that particular port. Well, I don't think that the benefits of a free port can be that great to actually be a key for survival. If the situation in a port uh, is, is, is that dramatic, I don't think the free port status will, will Will change. There is a number. Uh, uh, there were other reports about free ports that already had investment. They already had. They already invested in new technologies. They already had uh, special uh, um, special uh, plans for for kind of um, uh, green um, green investment, green infrastructure, and so on. And they were applying for for a, a free port status. Again, I don't necessarily. I'm not necessarily sure that the benefits uh, will equal the upfront investment. Uh, I'm not entirely sure who will, um, who will be making that investment, whether it's just the port or whether the government will be supporting uh, the ports, because there is an upfront investment in terms of um, fencing off the, 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 the port, making sure it's secure, uh, providing the additional staff, providing the additional procedures and IT systems and so on. Um, I think the benefits of free ports might be slightly oversold. I'm not saying that there are absolutely no benefits. I'm just not entirely sure that that uh, they're as great as um, as a lot of ports are, are expecting them to be. I think there might be a bit of a uh, I don't know situation where, where ports might be a bit disillusioned uh, once they're after they're, they're received that that uh, status. 
I guess, again, we'll, we'll see what happens and we'll need to see what specific provisions will be granted to uh, ports with that status. But I will be quite um, cautious in terms of just what, how much that can change. I think it can be helpful for ports that are already doing well and operating well, but it's definitely not uh, something that will significantly uh, alter the port's um, activities, perhaps. Well, thank you for that. I'm certainly I'm conscious as well that your colleague uh, and co-author of the report, Dr. Peter Holmes, uh, has certainly questioned uh, free ports in the past uh, as well. But uh, my second question. I think that's yeah, agreement. Yeah, so, so my second question, just is regarding the, the section five of your of the report, it's Canada and Japan, the FTAs with the EU. Uh, in this, uh, you you touch upon um, it's the and I'll quote. Uh, it's the, the TBT measures, however, it only covers a subset of products, and the recognition of Canadian testing bodies is dependent on a further process laid down in the agreement. So, once again, on the issue of free ports, does that then indicate that uh, if there are to be uh, uh, some type of agreements uh, with uh, individual agreements with uh, with countries across the world, then potentially there will be different testing bodies, different regulations, different regimes will be put in place for each individual agreement, and as a consequence, that could make uh, free ports once again as a uh, as more of a challenge as compared to an opportunity. Yeah, I would separate the two, uh, so I will answer kind of the question separately because free ports um, are are not. So if you have a let's say if we have a UK Canada agreement, free ports are a separate customs area. They're completely outside of the of the of the agreement. So, for example, if you are importing something under preference, under preferential tariff, from uh, from um, let's say Canada, and it goes into a free port, then the status of the, the preferential status is lost. It's it's it, you can't you can't use a free port in that respect. Uh, for in order for for a free trade agreement to apply and tariffs to be reduced, you need to ship it directly. A free port is, is a completely separate entity. Which this is what I mean by saying that it adds another border, it adds another another layer of, of difficulty. It's, it's a completely separate uh, separate entity, so that wouldn't apply. In terms of TBT requirements and in fact SPS requirements as well, you're absolutely correct. If we look at the report and if we look at different uh, examples and case studies, and if we look at agreements around the world. Uh, that's what I meant at the beginning when I said that mm, FTAs are not equal, are not created equal. Just because you have an FTA with a certain country doesn't mean that the provisions on uh, SPS, on TBT uh, requirements, will be exactly the same. So, yes, indeed, that creates a situation whereby uh, UK, uh, just as EU has done so far, might agree different uh, things on, in these areas with different partners. Whereby an exporter from the from the uh, UK, as it is now with the EU, uh, will need to comply. Will need to know that okay, for for let's say for Canada, I can get my product tested in the local uh, testing facility that has been approved and and has been recognised. But for another trade partner, I cannot do it, and I have to do something else. Uh, so yes, that's definitely that's definitely the case. That different agreements have different provisions, and there will be uh, differences. But again, that's something that uh, if if companies already export to a number of different countries, they are familiar with that, That, uh, especially on TBT and SPS requirements. They, these are very complex areas whereby regulation differs per, per partner. Customs is slightly, okay. uh, you stop slightly different. Can you just stop, you just stop yeah. you there, because I'm afraid to move on, because we're already over time. Uh, and I now want to go to Kenneth Gibson. Thanks. Yes, thanks very much, uh, Convener. Good morning, Anna. Um, I've been interested in some of the discussion with regard to bilateral agreements, and uh, I was looking at the Ukrainian Association Agreement, and I realise that even with that agreement, waiting time it, it can be up to 25 hours or sometimes longer. So I'm just wondering how effective these bilateral agreements could be with regard to the UK, and also I'm just wondering um, what uh, what do you believe. I know this is a difficult one because there's different, obviously, there'll be different agreements and some haven't been signed, etc. But given where we are now, what do you believe the collective annual costs the UK business will be of these additional border and customs checks with EU countries? 
Okay, um, uh, so I'll start with the first one. Um, yes, um, borders uh, like the one with Ukraine can come with significant waiting times. Turkey is another one where these waiting times can be uh, way well beyond 24 hours, and there there be reports of, of cases, days, or periods where where the borders are particularly um, uh, blocked or, or they are in a bottleneck. I think in terms of agreements, I think, and again, and that's, a, that's a key point, when, when people hear free trade agreement or a customs union, they ultimately think that, that the word free in the, in the free trade agreement means that border is frictionless, when this is very much not the case. In terms of EU's free trade agreement, one of the, one of the borders, perhaps less trade agreements, perhaps borders, where a significant reduction in terms of waiting times and uh, red tape and procedures uh, has been achieved is the uh, border with Norway. Uh, now that really has very little with with the agreement itself. It's ha it has a lot to do with bilateral cooperation between Norway and Sweden that pre predates uh, the uh, the EU participation. So one of the things, and again, I think that's mentioned in the report. One of the things that the EU, that Norway and and Sweden have done is that they have established joint customs offices whereby there's so much customs cooperation between these two parties that companies can submit at the export and import side of the of the of the process in one at one at the same time which leads to significant um reduction in in the amount of time required and also waiting times and so on uh, i think the big, the biggest point to make here is that the agreement a potential FDA with the, between UK and the EU will only be part of the solution. Uh, any agreement, and especially the draft agreements that I've seen from both the EU and the UK, include a, a provision on customs cooperation between the two. And this is where reductions in terms of waiting time can occur. So whether or not we have an agreement, particularly, uh, obviously, this will be much easier if we have an agreement, there will be a need for for cooperation in terms of customs procedure and border procedures between uh, b between the parties. Just an FTA in itself will not solve these difficulties relating to um, to um, waiting times, especially in 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 the case of what we talked about earlier, uh, delays in Kent and bottlenecks in Kent. A lot of this is also related to traffic management on our side. As well as for France on, on their side, but they, I think they've got it covered a bit, a bit better than we do. So there, there's two points here. One is that the kind of part of it, the internal traffic management is up to the UK, and that's something that the UK needs to, needs to uh, sort out and provide solutions for that. The other part is that to facilitate trade at the borders, it's not necessarily the, the, the key point isn't necessarily within the free trade agreement. The key point is in, in terms of cooperation, uh, customs cooperation between the parties. So that's slightly separate. An FTA facilitates that, but it's not necessarily the answer. It's not the final answer in order to 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 facilitate trade. That makes sense. I appreciate this is a bit complex, but uh, oh. and, and, a, and a bit <laughs> and a bit unclear maybe in the way I explain it. But basically, the FTA by itself, without the customs cooperation, doesn't help in terms of waiting time. I, th I think I think ultimately, though, what we're looking at for is what is going to be the impact on. Uh, you know the costs to, to UK businesses um, yeah. and yeah. competitiveness and employment. That, that's really the kind of crux yeah. of what I was looking to yeah. ask. And, uh, and, 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 and added to that, we, uh, well, Stuart Stevenson, Beatrice Wisher, and others have talked about, for example, vulnerable sectors such as uh, you know fish and animal products. But I'm wondering what other products products will be particularly affected. Because if we're talking about impact on competitiveness, there will be some businesses that will become clearly less competitive because they're having to pay out costs which at the moment they don't have to have. So um, that's why I'm yeah. looking at that particular issue. So I'm just yeah. wondering if you can respond on those. Um, issues, thanks. Yeah, I'll try to I'll, I'll try to be brief. In terms of cost of a business, um, uh, there have been some uh, official estimates and so on. I don't actually believe that you can give a full number, and I'll explain why. You can estimate how much it's going to uh, um, how much it's going to cost for the additional customs declarations and customs and admin procedures. You have a set cost of uh, for customs uh, import or export declaration that's between roughly. Uh, 15 pounds and 40, 45 pounds, depending on what you include in it. There are obviously premium services, 
for a more complex uh, import and export declaration, you can go up to as high as 70, 80 pounds per declaration. You can calculate that. You can multiply it by a number of additional customs declarations. What you cannot absolutely estimate, and I don't think that anyone can give that number, is the internal cost to businesses, cost of hiring additional staff, cost of getting uh, an advice from a consultant, cost of um, uh, under, trying to understand what the new regulations are. There are other costs, such as uh, costs of, of if you have products that, that uh, have SPS requirements, uh, uh, costs of, of uh, obtaining certificates, of going through the border inspector posts, posts uh, the, the additional fees re related to that. So the cost will be very different depending on the industry. But again, no one can fully um, estimate the cost of, of the in internal cost of businesses or something like the cost of a new IT system. Again, that's that's impossible to estimate. The cost will be uh, significant, but but I would not. Um, I've seen a number of estimates, and I do not necessarily think that they're full estimates. I think that they leave quite a lot out. In terms of businesses that will be particularly sensitive, are uh, uh, other than um, perishable goods, food, and uh, animal products, any business that is highly regulated. So there's a lot of chemicals. Uh, uh, automotive sector, the businesses that are highly regulated, pharma, these kind of businesses that require additional um, certificate permits, um, they need to comply with um, with a number of uh, other requirements before they even get to the border. That's going to be impacted because it's the time that it takes business to get the good from, from when it's, the good is produced to when it's actually uh, ready to be exported. And again, Thanks. it's difficult I mean, to estimate because it's an additional time. Yeah, thanks very much. I know that the GSK, for example, uh, told me that they spent uh, £70 million pounds to start one company preparing for Brexit. Just one final uh, question, if I may convene, and that's uh, um, following the shenanigans in Westminster this week, uh, Joe Biden, who is obviously the Democratic candidate, and uh, uh, um, uh, and Nancy Pelosi, who is uh, Speaker of the House of Representatives, have made it clear, uh, and I would just like to quote uh, Nancy Pelosi saying that's absolutely Absolutely no chance of a US-UK trade deal passing Congress if the Good Friday Agreement is undermined. I am just wondering if there will be further impacts uh, on uh, trade agreements, um, not just with the United States, but other countries, if that is perceived to be under undermined and, indeed, the UK government continues down its path of breaking international law. Yeah, I think this is an extremely serious <laughs> issue. I, I, I think we are all wrapped up in our Brexit <laughs> debate and, and, and the talks with the EU, but I do not think we are fully appreciative of uh, the reputational angle of this and what does it mean for a country. And also, and, and again, I've mentioned this before, a country that wants to be a new important player on the international scene, wants to be the global Britain, wants to sign a number of trade agreements, wants to sign agreements with countries that the EU hasn't been able to sign trade agreements with. For a country like this that re-enters the international um, scene, the, the kind of international with its own independent trade policy, to start that process by breaking international law uh, is a very serious matter, and I really hope that this is part of a uh, of a negotiation game rather than um, something that the UK government is seriously considering. Because uh, again, we have to be aware of the fact that the whole world is watching. Other countries are are, are watching and are trying to understand how reliable. What, what type of partner, trading partner, the UK is going to be, and this is not looking very well. Obviously, uh, you have the, the Good Friday argument aspect to it, but you also have just the aspect of a country breaking its own uh, its own agreement and breaking international law. I think this is incredibly serious, and uh, I really hope again that this is part of of, of, of um, negotiations and a way to gain an upper hand and a way to kind of. Um, gain uh, leverage in the negotiations rather than an actual attempt and and I hope the UK government is not going to go through with this uh, th th this is this is not uh, something that I would expect uh, a couple of weeks before this is uh, um, this is quite serious yeah madness thanks very much thanks Anna thanks Camille. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Gibson. Um, can I take this opportunity to thank Anna Zerzewska for her evidence today and for producing her report as part of our future relationship inquiry? Uh, that now concludes our questions and evidence session. Um, the committee will consider the evidence heard in private later in the meeting. Um, but before um, I move on, I would like to put on record my sincere thanks to Stuart McMillan, MSP, who joined the committee in September 2016 for the extensive and valuable contribution he has made to the work of the committee, and we wish him well 
in his uh, new position uh, on the COVID committee. I will now suspend the meeting while the panel, um, uh, while we uh, allow for the panel uh, for the next part of our agenda to be put in place. Thank you. Hello, our next agenda item is an evidence session on Scotland Census. Can I welcome to the meeting Paul Law, the Chief Executive and Register General for Scotland, Pete Whitehouse, the Director of Statistical Services, Anne Slater, Director of Operations and National Records of Scotland, and Jamie McQueen, uh, a lawyer with the Scottish Government. I would once again remind members to give broadcasting staff a few seconds to operate your microphones uh, before beginning to answer, ask your question or to provide an answer. And I would be grateful if questions and answers could be kept as succinct as possible. Before we move to questions, I would like to invite Paul Lowe to make a brief opening statement of around two to three minutes. Mr Lowe. Thank you very much, Convener, and good morning to you and to the committee members. Uh, before I get to the substantial part of my introduction, I would like to take this opportunity just to record my thanks to colleagues in NRS for their very significant contributions working with a range of partners during this terrible pandemic. Uh, their, com their commitment to progressing essential work in the COVID response across a range of other important services and indeed with the census has been truly substantial and impressive. Since colleagues were last in front of this committee, uh, it's fair to say somewhat mildly that the world has significantly changed. In March 2020, my organisation was working to deliver the census from, for March 21. At this point, our programme was on track but there remained significant work that needed to be done. The census order was in place, and we were working hard with the committee and others uh, to progress the regulations. We were, we were learning the lessons from a very successful census rehearsal and moving into the next phase where we were about to undertake further significant development work, testing, and the onboarding of very substantial field and programme resources. Our delivery confidence was based on the appreciation of the skills, capacity and commitment of NRS staff and our partners, and indeed where we were in the delivery of our plans. But contingency, of course, is not limitless. There remained a challenging but achievable amount of work to do. Um, success, however, was conditional on the fact that there would be no major and sustained disruption to our work. The immediate and continuing impact of COVID has unfortunately delivered a level of disruption that most of us have not experienced in our lifetimes. It has led NRS to recommend that the best way forward for securing the long-term value and benefits of the census is to move the census date to March 2022. As the organisation tasked to deliver the census, this is not something that we've taken lightly. However, we've reached this conclusion followed a detailed impact assessment work, which I've shared details of in, in our submission to the committee and a summary of which we've provided. 
the work included also an independent assessment of the status of the programme, which by May was reporting that the programme had shifted down to a red status. As the committee are, are aware, Scottish ministers received NRS's recommendations and subsequently informed the Scottish Parliament and the committee of the intention to move the census to March 22. This is the timescale to which we are now operating. Currently, NRS are in the phase of an intense replanning exercise, and we are working with our contractors and partners, and also with NR, uh, NISRA and ONS, uh, in terms of supporting the delivery of their respective censuses and working with data users to meet, the, meet uh, their needs. The impact of COVID has and continues to be tragic and substantial. My responsibility with regards to the census is to ensure that we gather and provide a census that, that, that submits the, the, the vital and accurate data in a safe, secure and efficient manner. We only get one opportunity to ask the people of Scotland these questions in each cycle, and it's important that we do so in a way that allows this to be done effectively in a, and with high quality, not only to meet short-term needs, but for many years to come. The decision to move the census to March 22 does in our assessment provide that very best opportunity to put in place a census of the right quality to deliver for our users? Thank you for this opportunity. I would welcome any questions from the committee. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Mr Lowe, and thank you very much also for your uh, submission uh, to the committee, which is, is very helpful. Uh, you say in your submission, uh, obviously, that the census delay, as you have said now, was due to the pandemic. Um, however, in the submission, uh, you also say that prior to the pandemic, the Census Programme Board had reported that their delivery confidence assessment had moved from amber red to amber. Uh, you, you said it moved to red in your comments, but I think you maybe you misspoke. Did you? It moved to amber. Is that correct? Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much, Convener. Just just to clarify, we've had a number of independent assessments carried out on the program. So pre-COVID um, pandemic, we had an assessment undertaken at the end of February, early March, which put the program at amber status, and that means that delivery of the program is feasible. A program that's a year or more out to delivery, uh, an amber assessment would be relatively common in that type of review. We had a follow-up review yeah. that was undertaken uh, towards the end of May, obviously several months on and, and, and some time into the pandemic, which was suggesting that the impacts of the pandemic were more significant and, and recommended that the programme was put at red status in, in light of the COVID challenges. All right, I see. Okay. Um, because what I was going to ask you uh, was that, you know, that suggests to me uh, an amber status does not suggest to me that you're on track in terms of traffic lights, as I can recall from my highway code, you know, amber means wait, it doesn't mean go. Yeah, th thanks, Convener. Um, just just to clarify, this is a very a very specific set of definitions that are linked to the uh, the project review methodology gateway review. I'm a gateway reviewer myself, uh, and I review other projects. So um, this is based on on what's called a del delivery confidence assessment. Um, and so an, an amber assessment is that delivery of the program is seen to be feasible, but there are challenges. Um, it's, it's obviously based on, on assessment of what needs to happen over uh, over the, the the period ahead. So, in a, a major program, a year a year or more before delivery, it would be common if a program was in a reasonable position to have an amber or or at best an amber green assessment that the, the rating went above. Uh, if the program has been rated amber red or red, it would be in a more con uh, concerning position. But certainly, we've had a, a range of, of of assurance reviews, independent assurance reviews undertaken in the census program. We have a, a program of them going ahead, and all of these are pointed um, in the period just before the pandemic came in that there had been significant progress made in the program, and that uh, delivery in March 21 at that time was deemed to be feasible. Right. It's just I am looking at one particular report, which was from October 2019 from the Office for Statistics Regulation, uh, which looked at all, how all the census authorities across the UK were progressing. It was titled Assessment of Compliance with the Code of Practice for Statistics for the 2021 Census. That report suggests that NRS had experienced difficulties. For example, in paragraph 4.5, it says that NRS told the regulator it faced challenges including procurement issues, concerns over decision-making and contingency planning. 
and it goes on to say that you were putting a new governance structure in place to deal with those things. It did acknowledge that you were dealing with those difficulties, but it does say, and I quote, nevertheless, there remains a delivery risk for census outputs in Scotland, and we welcome the ongoing dialogue with NRS as it continues to manage these risks. So, it, you know, it, it strikes me that you did have quite significant difficulties um, already, and the fact that you're now in red, despite having delayed in order to catch up, does suggest to me that there are some serious problems within NRS. Thank you, Convener. Um, just, to, just to clarify, when I, when I came into the organisation, there were some challenges with delivery of the census programme, and they were picked up, as you say, in elements of the OSR review at the time back in October 2019. Um, I'll hand over to Pete in a few minutes, but we've, we've had follow-up um, assessment activity from OSR in the last few weeks, which is a much more positive outcome. What I would say is that that, 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 that red assessment was, was, was in May before the decision was taken to uh, change the census date. So the, so the delivery confidence assessment of red is based on the status of the program if there was an expectation to deliver in March 21 based on COVID. That same report stated that if um, decisions were taken to look at the timeline of the census program, and that was obviously uh, under, cons under consideration at the time, then the delivery confidence assessment of the program uh, would be amber or better. So, so that red is very much based on the, the challenges of COVID, uh, not just at that, that point in the program, but the future likely challenges of COVID for delivery to March 21. It's not an assessment of the health of the program if it was being delivered to March 22. Um, Pete, might it be helpful if you said a few words just about the, the OSR review process and, and the most recent follow-up activity on the report that the, the convener references? Yes, happy to, and uh, morning to everybody. So, the OSR um, organisation that – sorry, um, are you okay to keep going? Yes, you're fine. Yeah. We can hear you okay. clearly. Okay, thank you. Um, so, the OSR is an organisation that um, – works with the statistical census agency, so with OSR, with NISRA, with Welsh Government and ourselves, in order to help us reflect on the progress we're making, but also to ask us questions around how are we meeting our users' needs. Their focus is very much on how are you ensuring the quality of the data that you're going to produce? How, how, is, how are you explaining to the public? How are you explaining to those who you are going to take data from? How are you explaining to those that you are looking to provide data to where you are in that progress and in that process and how you are going to deliver the public value that is required? Um, the conversations largely happen within the organisation, so colleagues from OSR will come in and speak to colleagues with, within NSR, as they do with ONS and NISRA and elsewhere. And and it is from that where people have a very um, a, a sort of informal conversation, a very open, because it's a collaborative exercise. It's an opportunity for statisticians in the in the main to talk to each other about the challenges that they see. These are not challenges that are necessarily saying, "Okay, we cannot do this." This is much more about we are aware of the challenges ahead of us. We are aware of the work that we need to do. What advice can OSR give us? What advice can we learn from our other colleagues across the UK in order to be transparent, to make sure that the information is out there to the public? And it's largely within that context. So they set out a, a series of assessments which we are going through and um, which we publish on our website and we make available for others to, to read and to come back with us. We are continually working with them. We've had conversations very recently about the work we're doing to make sure that our methodology is, is in the public domain, that our rationale around the work that we are planning for the next year into March 22 is clear and understood, and that all that in, in, information is there. So, so the way I would characterize the OSR is it's very much about focusing on are we doing what we need to do to let people know where we are with our program delivery? And then also, how are we learning from each other to ensure that what we do is to the high quality? Okay, thanks very much for that answer. That, that's all, all, all very well, and understand it is a collaborative process. But nevertheless, 
Uh, they did say that there was a delivery risk, and, and Paul uh, has uh, acknowledged that there were some uh, problems, uh, as outlined in that uh, October report, um, that um, ha he had come in and uh, had been tackling. Uh, but I know that other members want to explore some of these issues, so I shall move on to the Deputy Convener, Claire Baker. Um, thank you, Convener. Um, I do appreciate it has been a difficult decision to, um, to cancel the census next year and move it forward a year, but looking at the paper that was given, I don't see anybody else has taken that decision. The rest of the UK will proceed, and you gave uh, examples from Australia and Canada and the US. While it is find it challenging to deliver, there is still an attempt to go ahead with a census. The the response rate, you're suggesting the spot you had concerns over response rate, which is moving from a predicted 95 down to 60 or 80 per cent response rate under the various scenarios you looked at for possible delivery. I try to understand why it is so low when ONS and the rest of the UK are going to proceed with and why they don't feel they're going to have the same kind of drop in response rate, why in Scotland predicted to be um, to be so low. Thank, thank you for the question. Um, just, just to clarify, in terms of what's happening internationally around around censuses, first, um, the Republic of Ireland have announced this week that they're delaying their 2021 census to April 2022, um, and we understand that uh, the censuses in India are also contemplating this course of action. In terms of uh, Australia and New Zealand, um, but the, the the impacts of COVID on their census are still under under contemplation, but what they have announced is that uh, they're put, the public rehearsal in Australia is being delayed, uh, a major public testing in the New Zealand census uh, is being delayed as well. Uh, in North America, obviously, the, uh, the US census uh, was, in li was live at the time the pandemic hit. Their, their reference date was the 1st of April, and they'd already started their census. Um, the implications of COVID in the US census are, are still to be to be evaluated, but but what what has happened is that they have more than doubled their field force collection, so they will have field force agents out in the U.S. until uh, the end of October, um, twice the length of their anticipated period, and there have been concerns um, expressed in relation to uh, the, the the response rates um, that they've received. Um, in terms of uh, NISRA and and Dorines, uh, their position is that they are continuing at the present to work towards March 2021. Obviously, I can't speak in detail about the, their internal decision making as to, to why they're proceeding on that route. That's obviously a matter for them and for the respective governments to oversee the census in those parts of the uh, of the United Kingdom. Um, what I would say is there are differences in the design. Sorry, sorry to interrupt because you do give quite a complicated explanation for why ONS are proceeding. That's to do with their ability to mitigate in different ways in which they collect. I find that quite difficult to to follow. You seem to say it because of the size of the organisation or the setup, or trying to work out why we are different in Scotland. Thanks. Um, yeah, so there there are differences in design of the censuses between between different parts of the UK and certainly between Scotland. And it might be helpful to bring Pete in to answer some of those more technical questions as the uh, as our chief statistician for NRS. Um, there is a concern. There is a concern about the impact of COVID on resp in response rates across the whole of the UK. Um, ONS, independently of the census, have been working for some years to develop what's called administrative data. So it's it's data sources that exist in other parts of of the government and public sector. Um, what they they hope to do, if necessary, is if there are low response rates uh, from the census. That they will access and use that administrative data to see if they can fill gaps. And what I would say is that uh, ONS are a hugely capable organisation, and they um, they they have the ability to uh, to progress solutions like this in a way that many parts of the world um, can't. But these are experimental, and they're also data that's not available. It's not legally accessible uh, in Scotland, so we don't have access to that. So, so part of the equation here is that. Uh, is that there is a recognition that response rates is a concern and an issue for everybody, um, but they have access to solutions that we do not have in Scotland. If that arises, 
compensate and the risk we would we would face in Scotland if we proceeded and we had low response rates, we don't have a way of accessing data to, from other places to fill in gaps in the same way. Uh, Pete, I don't know if there's anything you want to add in respect of that. Thank you. Um, yes, I think it, it is that we are in we, we start in, in a place where there is concern across all census organisations about how to put a census in the field in these times. Um, ONS is, as, as Paul has said, ONS is a, is a very significant organisation that runs social surveys, economic surveys, does a, a lot of work around statistical methodology, has a lot of links into academia and a lot of IT. Um, knowledge and scope. Um, we were both ready in February, March in 2020 to run our respective census designs and to put in place our census. We had, as Paul said, we, had, we had still had a lot of work to do, but, uh, but our assessments as ONSs are were that these things were manageable. Where we are now is that so our census design was suitable and appropriate for delivering what we were intending to do. COVID comes in and hits the, 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 our ability to do that in a way that means that our response rates, our considered view was that what we would likely get if we went in March 21 is a response rate that would be somewhere between sort of 60 and 80 percent. Now, the impact of that is that we would be likely to miss lots of vulnerable individuals. Sorry to interrupt again. Sorry. If you know, take this as much. Sorry to interrupt again, and you know, I'll take this as my second question. But I still don't understand why we'd go from 95 and 60 to 80. Is it because there wouldn't be a field force? Is it because, I mean, you told us in previous meetings that we were moving to online because that was the way everybody worked now, and that would improve uh, response rates, and because we're paper, just the last census in 2011. So it's why would it be such a big drop from 95 down to 60 percent? Okay, thank you. Um, so the the intent the the ambition for the census is to run a successful census. We want ninety somewhere in the ninety percent response, whether that's online or paper. And in two thousand eleven, we had a ninety four percent response rate. So that kind of gives us our what we're aiming for. If we don't have a field force, which if through our work in terms of looking at options, given the challenges that we were facing through. Um, this COVID pandemic, that to put in place a census in March 21 would have meant to have run it without a field force. So these are the people who are out there in the streets, helping people to fill the census in, knocking on doors, helping uptake, but also helping people who, who might need support around some of the, the sort of paper forms. If we didn't have that in place, what we are left with is, um, is an approach that would either be completely online, which is one of the options, which would mean we would lose the digitally excluded people or people who don't feel able to do that. If we went completely on paper, we would um, we, ha we have issues with where to go to um, a response rate. So some people might get the form and decide not to respond, and you need a field force to kind of help that. If you do both of these things, an online and a paper response, you are still going to miss a good number of people. And one of the points of the census and why it's so critical is it allows us, once in a cycle, as Paul says, to go and get information at that very detailed local level about all of our people across Scotland. It's not like a survey where we go and select 6,000 households or whatever it might be. This is about trying to get the really detailed information that we require at that local level. So therefore, our caution has to be around how do you put a census in place that allows us to get as close as possible to a good mid-90s response. And our conclusion through our work was that without a field force and going in March 21, we would miss 20, 30 percent of our population. And it's not that we would miss the average. We would miss the very people for whom the census is the most important tool in gathering that information. That takes us to our decision which says that actually a, a, a census in March 21 would not deliver the quality. As Paul said, ONS have different options in front of them because of, in part, the work that they have been doing for a number of years to gather information from different bits of um, the public sector, local authorities, um, other big GB and UK organisations. 
because of that, they're able, they, that wasn't part of their census design necessarily, but because they were doing that work as part of one of their major strands, they were able to use that in order to give themselves some confidence that if response rates in England and Wales hit 80 percent, they can understand who is missing. They can use that evidence in order to improve their statistical estimation. So that's the difference. We just don't have that information. So we would be left with a response rate that was low and biased and without confidence that we could produce the outputs that our users need. ONS's view is that they will work very hard and they will do to improve, to make sure that response rates are as high as possible. If they do turn out to be low or, or problematic, they have other data and statistical methods that they will then apply. And what they have also talked about is that there will then need to be some consideration of the precision of those estimates and also the time scale that it takes for them to deliver them. Okay. Can I just stop you there? Because um, we are going to have to move through a number of, uh, of members on the committee. I realise that this is a technical subject, but if I could ask for answers to be kept as succinct as possible. Thanks very much. And we'll now move on to Dean Lockhart. Thank you very much, Convener. I'll, I'll try to keep this brief. Um, could I ask about the, the estimated cost involved in postponing the census uh, as described? Yeah, thank you. Um, obviously, we've taken the decision um, to reschedule the census based on achieving the best value and uh, best value for money out of the census. We're currently undertaking a detailed uh, replanning exercise on the census, and this will include the additional costs um, for delivering the census. So I'm quite happy to write to the committee setting out in more detail once we've concluded that exercise, which will be soon, uh, the outcome of that. What I would say is that it's not a comparison between what the, the original situation and, and the, the, uh, the new census date. It's likely that any census organisation attempting to deliver um, the census in 2021 at the moment is likely to incur costs, COVID-related costs, in trying to deliver that census to, in some shape or form, to its plan. So I don't think it's as, as binary as, as as the original plan versus rescheduling it. Uh, but certainly, we'll be happy to provide that information to the committee. Thank you. That that would be helpful. And the other um, area I wanted to touch on was the public policy implications of census data being gathered in different years in Scotland compared to the rest of the UK. What, what, what will be the sort of data implications as well as wider public policy implications of those two uh, systems running out of sync? Yeah, thank you. I'll perhaps say a little bit about that, and then perhaps uh, Pete can say a bit more from a, from a statistical perspective. Um, all of the, um, the the bodies that take censuses in the UK are working very closely on this. Our collective view is that that these issues are surmountable. Uh, so that's certainly the view of the uh, the national statistician. Um, I think we agree it's not an ideal position, but there are existing methodologies and approaches in place that we can use. One of the things I would say is that we produce lots of data based on the census in years when the, when a census isn't running. So there are ways of bridging data gaps using existing census data and other surveys and methodological approaches that we use. Uh, Pete, I don't know if you want to add to that. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, yeah, so one so one of the key things is um, is clearly how do we deal with population estimates? So the census is one of the key tools that we use and use every ten years or so to allow us to add births, subtract deaths, and add migration. And it's that approach that produces our population estimates. These themselves then go into helping with allocation formulas, but also giving us um, uh, any rates information in terms of um, lots of other statistics, um, most recently, obviously, happening with COVID and, uh, and mortality rates. So we are very conscious of the need to ensure that those that, that information is provided. Um, we have some past experience of, and this happened after 2011, of censuses delivering their population estimates at different times. What happened then is that the, the nations came together to agree that um, you could produce a, a UK population estimate based on census data in some cases, and then rolled forward census data from a previous period. What then happens is that people run their allocation formulas 
and then they look to readjust them when uh, the new census data comes on screen. We're also very conscious that there will be other users who will be looking at this because there's specific data, whether that's around equality groups or particular interest groups, and we will be having conversations and engagements with them and making sure that we are very clear on our website about the, the way that we're going to help them to, um, to have information as we run through 22, 23, 24 and onwards. So we're absolutely uh, very clear of this as an important component of work. So we will be putting in place work. Um, the aforementioned OSR will be helping us to do that to make sure that we speak and engage fully with all the UK users of census data, as well as those within Scotland. And I know that there are a number of groups that are already in place across the Government Statistical Service, so that's with ONS, Welsh Government, NISRA, ourselves, that will be looking at this. And, and one final point I would make is actually in NRS, we have this as our issue in that in my directorate, I, you know, we produce the census to some degree, but I'm also, we are a customer of it because we're also responsible for the population estimates for Scotland. So. This is an issue that is very close to us and will help us support uh, data users across the country and across the UK. And a very brief follow-up, if, if I can. In terms of public policy or finance policy and the block grant adjustment, what, what statistics will be used uh, with the UK or the rest of the UK for the purposes of the block grant adjustment? So, it, what happened after the 2011 census was that there was a nine-month gap in when Scotland census population estimates came out compared to the rest of the UK. And as I say, what happened there is that we have population estimates. So, what happened in 2011 is that England and Wales and Northern Ireland had their 2011 census data. We were using our 2001 data, which we would be rolling forward. So each year you add births, you take off deaths, and you add migration information, and that gives you your population estimates. You use the census then to kind of calibrate that and, and, and to see whether, how, whether you need to make adjustments. That's the process that will happen. We will have those conversations. We managed to do that successfully in 2012, and we will do so again. I would also say that there is work that is going on across the UK to look at our migration statistics and how we use administrative data from different sources such as NHS data in order to help inform that. So the quality of those estimates should be improving as well. Thank you very much. Uh, that's all I had, convener. Thank you very much. And I move on to Stuart Stevenson. Uh, good morning and thank you, uh, convener. I want to, first of all, uh, pick up on another aspect of the delay to the census. Clearly, that uh, would appear to reduce the time between this census and the following one from 10 years to nine years. And I just want to be clear of what planning has been done uh, to squeeze 10 years' work into nine years and what the implications of that are. Thanks very much. I mean, the, the, the census programme is approximately about six years in delivery, so it's not a full ten year, ten year to ten years. So there is there is scope within the delivery of the census to to compensate. Obviously, the dates for when for when future censuses are set are matters for the Parliament and for the Scottish Government. So uh, NRS will produce um, recommendations after the census. Uh, in 2022, but obviously it would be for ministers and the parliament to, to fix the date of the next census, and then NRS will, will progress with the delivery against those plans. I, I suppose that uh, opens up the question of if it only takes you six years, what do you do for the other four? Um, and, well, NRS obviously undertakes a, a broad range of work, and notwithstanding the uh, Notwithstanding the census, and, and obviously happy to go into that in more detail. But what happens in the organisation is that we we gear up our staffing and resources in step for when we're delivering the program. So we have a number of people in the program who come come into the organisation to deliver it, and then some of them will go away at the conclusion of the program. So so we're not setting with a kind of a high level of of staff for the, for the ten years. 
Um, and, Convena, I know these were two questions that were very short ones. Finally, and again, quite short, um, given that we're going to be a year out of step, and you've discussed some of the issues around that, what other policy areas in uh, public, the public domain are going to be affected by the delay? I mean, does this affect health service planning? Does it affect infrastructure um, decisions and so on and so forth? In other words, it's not just an issue for NRS. It's an issue for all the uh, bodies in the public sector that depend on it. Yeah, th thank you for the question. I mean, we, we, we know who our data users are and we engage with them very closely. Um, what I would say, and, and it comes back to our earlier answer, is that, that we produce a range of statistics and information that are used by these stakeholders out with the census. So each year we produce mid-year population estimates, for example, and that sort of data is used by a, ra a range of a range of stakeholders. And as Pete explained, um, because we're also responsible for the, the registration system, we have really good figures on births and deaths in Scotland. Uh, and as Pete also mentioned, the other factor where population will, will change is migration. Uh, and there is an existing UK model for, for migration statistics. Um, but what we're doing at the moment collectively anyway, and it was, it was out with of, um, census considerations, is that ONS and NISRA and ourselves are working to produce a, a more robust uh, migration model. So there are lots of statistics that uh, and information we produce will help these groups, and we'll work really closely with them uh, over the period to make sure that, uh, that, uh, that this issue is mitigated. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we now move to questions from Beatrice Wishart, followed by Annabelle Ewing. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, I'd like to go back a step to before COVID, if any of us can remember what life was like before that. Um, but looking at um, the uh, looking at delivering the census for March 21. Um, and, and reflecting on, on the convener's line of questioning as well, that it seemed to indicate that there was um, a bit of a problem. Uh, did, uh, did you look at additional resourcing or, or capacity in order to deliver for March 21? Um, did you consider, was it an option? Did you consider that? And, and did you flag that up with Scottish ministers? Thank you. Um, I'd probably just clarify the, the initial point first. There were historic challenges in, in the census program. Certainly, when I arrived uh, at the in December Christmas in 2018, there were a number of assurance reports indicating that there were challenges in the program. However, since that that time, uh, a number of mitigations were put in place to improve the program. Uh, I reconstituted the program board. We brought in additional resources changed the governance in the programme, and there were a number of assurance reviews that came out late in 2019 and then into uh, 2020 that indicated that there had been substantial improvements in the programme that had been achieved. And as I say, the, the independent assurance that reports that I was receiving around about February, March time were indicating that the programme was perfectly feasible for delivery uh, in March uh, 2021, uh, pre-COVID pandemic. Um, as part of the options appraisal exercise, we looked hard at the, the option of delivering the census program still to March 21. So the first part of that is we looked at our original plan about how do we deliver the census in all of the shape and colour that it was planned for um, to that timescale, and were there any mitigations? Um, resourcing was one option that we looked at. However, I'm afraid that there are there are some things that, that additional people can't buy you out of not buy you out of trouble. So some of the things that we were looking at, for example, was it's really important to robustly test the census. A lot of that testing happens in the year uh, in the run-up to going live. It's important not only that all of the, the, the IT solutions and other things work as expected, but it's also really important that the data in them is protected as well from cyber attack and, and from other things. And certainly the, the, the last Australian census, for example, which was a digital census as well, uh, it, it was closed for the first three days because of a cyber attack. So the issues that we were facing included truncating a testing window, and, and that started to feel very risky in light of it being a digital census. But yes, we, we did look at those options as part of considering could we hold on to a March 21 date. That's helpful. That's the, my, the end of my questions, convener. Thank you. Thank you very much, Beatrice. Now we move on to Annabel Ewing. 
Thank you, convener. Um, on the issue of, of the, the new date, I mean, how confident are you that you won't be back at the committee, you know, sometime next year, saying you can't make it? Um, I, I, I'm, I'm, ve I'm very confident. We're, we're, we're delivering what we plan to do in March um, with contingency time. Um, obviously, the, the, the one scenario that, that would be a real risk is if we aren't able to find a, a solution to COVID. Um, I think uh, I think that I think that's less likely based on, on knowing more about the virus and. How, how, that, how we now manage those issues and options for how we can manage the census, even if COVID was still around. But, but I don't have any, I don't have any concerns, and certainly the, the, the assurance reviews that I'm getting done and the independent advice that I'm getting on the program all indicates that the, that the program is in a is in a good place for delivery in March 2022. Yeah, I mean, I asked the question because as we established at the outset of this session, you were NRS was already in amber before COVID. Um, I mean, I think you 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 said in a response to an earlier question from a colleague uh, that the detailed replanning exercise had not yet been completed. So, if that has not yet been completed, how can you reach a conclusion with conf reasonable confidence uh, on meeting the next deadline? I just wonder because you yourself said that you haven't completed that exercise. So. Yeah, th thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, can I just briefly clarify this point about 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 amber status? Um, amber status refers to a program being del being deliverable. Delivery is feasible. Um, a program that's a year or more out from delivery is unlikely to have a green assessment because there is a considerable amount of work still to deliver. So it's about that point in time that an assessment is undertaken. So an amber assessment is a reasonable assessment to take. I would say for context that the ONS program was also at amber at the same time. So so this was this this is not a, this is not an unusual or a negative uh, critique of the health of the Scottish Census program at the point before COVID arose. In fact, in fact, quite the opposite. Um, so. I think probably just important to clarify that in terms of the replanning. Um, I mean, it's a very, a very legitimate question to ask. What, what I would say though is we we had a plan before COVID of how we were going to deliver the program. So we knew all of the components, we knew their relationships, we knew when we needed them, how we were going to test them. The the, the replanning work is about how we take that plan and move it to to a later delivery date rather than a shorter delivery date. So pre-COVID, we had confidence that we had a plan for delivery to March 21. Um, it's not that there are any unknowns in that plan. It's now how we match that plan into a, an elongated period for delivery. So I think the risk around that is is less than in a scenario where we were trying to to do it into a, a more truncated timescale. Well, thank you for the answer. Um, Time will tell. Perhaps it would be useful if NRS could keep the committee uh, updated as to its progress in that regard. Thank you. Very happy to do so. Yeah. yeah thank you. Yes, thank that you. would be very helpful. I move on to Kenneth Gibson. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Convener. I noticed in the report actually that you provided that you said that they need at least ninety percent of responses for a, a, a census to be valid, and there was 94% in 2011. I mean, that still means there were 330,000 people in Scotland omitted. So I'm just wondering if um, we're looking to have a census in 2022, uh, if there's any focus on areas where there was a particularly low return. So 94% would be the average for Scotland, but were there any specific areas where it fell below 90%? And what steps have been taken to ensure that we get a higher return uh, next time, given that we're now talking about an eighteen-month preparation time. Yeah, that's that's a very it's a very important it's a very important point to make. In a second, I'll maybe hand over to Pete. You can talk a bit about how we how we adjust statistically where, where in areas where we don't have response. I think the the issue that you're articulating is is part of at the heart of why why we recommended to delay the census. That uh, trying to deliver it in March 21 really risked. Knowing, you know, having a, a higher um, number of people not responding. Um, so part of the work that we do for the census is, is 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 community engagement work. So we know 
from previous um, censuses, the sorts of populations that are more difficult to get results out of, and, and they can vary between countries, and they can vary over time, but we know that. And so part of the work we built in for, to the census was a very active community engagement program where we'd be going out and speaking to, to different groups, engaging with them to, to drive up awareness and participation in the census. And that's important activity before the census goes live. And obviously, because of the restrictions of the pandemic, that's something that we've not been able to do and was part of the reason why we recommended um, recommended uh, delay. So. Having having an active uh, community engagement and communications and education program are really important to target those groups because they're the people we need to know most about. Uh, but there are things we can do um, where it's relatively small numbers to compensate. Pete, I don't know if you want to say something about that. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, yeah, so we um, we have a number of approaches. Um, some of these are based on understanding how we. Um, use our field force, so our sort of support to people as the survey is in place, so we know which areas traditionally have had poorer or lower response rates, and so therefore we know where we need to um, place our additional supports to, to sort of help people in those areas to respond. We have thresholds where we um, expect um, response rates to be at certain levels, maybe at local authority levels or whatever that will allow us to say, okay, that gives us um, a sufficient coverage and in a general sense, and also assuring that we're not missing key parts of the community. So we, 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 will, we have those kind of data, which we, we learn from colleagues across the UK, but also our own experience. We also do some other things which are about using um, other data. So after the census is run, we also, something that's not really very well known, I think, is that we also run another survey that goes out after the census in order to help see whether it's called a census coverage survey, and it helps us understand whether we have missed any particular areas or particular bits of areas, and it gives us an understanding from a statistical perspective whether how we can make adjustments to the census data. And then what we also use is we use some other data that we're able to get hold of in order to quality assure the estimates that we're getting from our census. So this is a very much a statistical process which uses um, engagement through media, through comms, through local communities to engage with people, to help them fill the forms, aligned with our understanding of where people will need more support aligned with an, a, a kind of management information tool that tells us how the census is actually running so that we can reallocate field force support to do that. And then a number of statistical approaches which help us use other data, help us look at where we are missing information and to provide better quality estimates so that we produce a quality of outputs that is based on all of that. And I would say that we would also, and this is one of the key things for us from the stats perspective, is that we learn and will continue to learn from our colleagues and provide them with our learning across the rest of the UK and indeed internationally into this space, because we all have this issue. Okay, thank you very much for those two comprehensive answers, which are very helpful. I'm just wondering though about the level of variance, because you said, uh, you, you, you know, you both uh, 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 both speakers have said that. Um, you know, there are certain communities where traditionally there's been a lower uh, return from census. If we're talking about 90% being the accepted level at which below which a, a census is valid, are there many such areas? I mean, what is the variance? Is it 80 to 99%? Is it you know 92 to 96%? What is the level of variance uh, in Scotland? And you know, even with all the community uh, outreach, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, when do you consider? Um, the return level to be uh, such that information is not valid from that area. I mean, you can make statistical projections, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but given the fact that we're trying to base a whole number of public services on accurate information, where does that, um, where does the level of information that you receive become uh, go below a level, i.e., ninety percent, as you've said in your report, where you can no longer um, uh, consider it to be robust? Okay, so I can I don't have all of those numbers um, here, but I, I'm very happy to provide a paper back to the committee on on our threshold. So we do have expectations of response levels 
um, at a local authority level, which um, we have set out in our kind of quality assurance documents. So there they are published um, about what we would anticipate and need to have in terms of response. We know that there is, is when we talk about uh, the sort of um, areas or individuals or communities where we know response rates are, are, are more challenging, it's not that we accept that, it's more that what we're saying is that we know we need to put more focus into those areas through our community work, through our media, to encourage and engage with people to make sure that those censuses are, uh, returns are made. What we will then do, and this is again something that we do with the Office of Statistical Regulation, but also with other UK census organisations, is that we explain to our users the quality of the estimates that we are producing. So when we have gathered the data that we gather, when we assure it to the levels we do, when we understand whether there is missing information, we will produce estimates where we will say, okay, it's within plus or minus 0.5 of percent, or you know, there will be a, a presentation of the accuracy of that information. And that is what we will do, ONS will do that, and Israel will do that, all bodies do that. But I, I'm very happy to provide a paper that talks about how we are ensuring that we get the coverage and the completion rates that we need, and what we would then do in terms of making sure that all the data users are clear about the precision and accuracy of that data. Thanks. And just one Thank follow question for me on convener on this particular issue. No? Oh, sorry, I was just going to ask one more. And it's just about. Sorry? And be a very succinct answer, please. Oh, sorry. Uh, I, it was just about uh, about you, you talked about local authorities. I'm just wondering how, when, when you're looking at a community, what kind of scale of community are we talking about? How I mean, is it 500 houses, a thousand houses? Is it a particular town? I'm just wondering what you define as a community in terms of trying to put together uh, this statistical analysis. Okay. I, I mean, I was. I'm thinking very broadly. I'm thinking about uh, communities as in as groups in the population who may be across the whole of Scotland but have some shared characteristics which mean that they don't are able to respond very well or they can't respond very well, as well as some local areas where there might be aspects of, say, digital exclusion or there might be other things. We have to think about all of this in the round, but I, I'm more than, as I say, I'm happy to provide a bit, a bit more clearer detail in a, in a paper if that would be helpful. It would be. Thanks very much for that. I appreciate that, Pete. Thank you. Thanks, Camille. Thank you very much, Mr. Gibson. We can now move to our last, last questioner, who is Oliver Mundell. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, I wondered uh, whether uh, any additional resource had been requested from the Scottish Government and Scottish Ministers. Uh, we, we, we are in regular contact and engagement with Scottish Government about the resources that are needed to to deliver the program um uh, you know obviously as i've said earlier on in the in the presentation um it's likely there'll be some additional costs for and resource requirements for running the census for an additional year uh, we're concluding that for a replanning exercise and as offered earlier on happy to write to the committee to uh, set that out in more, in more detail so uh, just for clarity no request has been made Specific requests we made so far. Sorry, in, sorry. Can you clarify in respect of for for additional funds? You've not asked for any money already. Uh, uh, not yet. No, that that will come after we've uh, concluded the replanning exercise. That will then feed into a, a resource and a budget request for for the census for the for the revised date. So yeah. Thanks. And, and it's a sort of second substantive question I wanted to ask was just whether were Scottish ministers relaxed with the proposal to delay, or did they push back at all? I mean, I mean, obviously, I, I can't comment on the detail of, uh, of of ministerial thinking. I mean, what what I can say is that we um, we were asked for a range of additional information and and and. And, and questions in relation to, to our recommendation. There were conversations that went on over over some number of weeks. Um, the, the, some of the, the questions the committee have asked today are the sorts of questions that the ministers have asked of us about the 
uh, about the firmness of our assessment uh, uh, of the need to shift the date of the census, if there were any other mitigations um, that could be that could be taken, uh, exploration of of the options that we that were, were set out in the in the paper that we've shared. So so there are a range of uh, there are a range of issues. I don't think anyone um, anyone's taken the prospect, and certainly not not myself, of of uh, shifting the date of the census lightly. I didn't come. I didn't join NRS um, for this outcome. It's it's arrived as a result of, of COVID, unfortunately. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Mr. Mundell. Uh, we have a little bit of time in hand. If I could just ask um, a couple of very brief supplementaries, um, if you could maybe keep the answers brief. The first is actually in, uh, when Annabel Ewing, uh, Mr. Lowe, questioned you earlier, asking you for an assurance that the census would be delivered in 2022. You, you said in your answer that the only mitigating factor was if we haven't solved COVID by then. But given a lot of international experts are saying we may not have a vaccine by then, um, you know, like uh, I, I take it you're not you're not planning around a vaccine or elimination of COVID, are you? And we all hope that it will be eliminated, but presumably we have to plan for a continuation, local lockdowns, everything that we're seeing. Are you planning for all that, just to confirm? Yes. Yeah, so, sorry if I if I articulated the sentiment uh, uh, not very elegantly, but yeah, absolutely. We're not. Uh, there's a lot. There's a lot more understood about this about this virus, and a lot more understood about how how we would operate um, a census if COVID still still remains, and our assumptions are that. That is a distinct possibility. So we will plan and use mitigations uh, if, if COVID is still endemic in the population in in March 22. Obviously, there is a there is a hope that it might not be around, but if if it is around still, then very much we will we will take steps to manage that. Okay, that's great. Thanks very much. Now, I also wanted to raise an issue, a slightly different issue, um, relating to some of the committee's earlier work. Um, you may have noticed on the Committee's website, some correspondence um, in the last couple of months um, between ourselves and Professors Lindy, Lindsay Patterson and Susan McVeigh, who are very distinguished statistici statisticians at Edinburgh University. Now, Professors Patterson and McVeigh have been doing some work with some work with ONS regarding the regulations um or sorry rather the the guidance around the sex question for the ONS um census which is going ahead uh, next year um in the course of that they they wrote to you about this and you wrote back to them stating that no further revisions of the Scottish guidance could take place because our committee the CTEEA committee had approved the guidance um, and you, you said, as set out in Mrs. Hislop's letter to the CTEEA, uh, the agreement by the Scottish Parliament to the census order confirms that the sex question and associated guidance has been agreed. Now, as I've clarified in a letter to Professors Patterson and McVeigh, that is not actually the case. The committee recommended that the Scottish Parliament approve the draft census order in its report uh, dated on the 4th of March. But the committee um, has no uh, locus with regards to the guidance. In fact, the cabinet secretary has actually clarified this to the committee. Uh, she noted this in her oral evidence. Uh, she said, in the 30th of January 2020, she said the guidance is completely separate from the legal processes that we are considering. The committee's legal responsibilities relate to the order which sets out the subjects to be included and then the regulations, which will set out the questions. I know that the committee has become heavily involved in the guidance issues, but its legal responsibility relates to the order. So I just wondered, you know, like that I have written back to Professors Lindsay and McVeigh pointing this out. But since you are here, would you like to take this opportunity to clarify that what you told them was not the case and that the committee does not have the ability to approve or otherwise the guidance? Yeah, thank you, convener, and apologies at the, for that error in my my original letter. I can confirm that I have written to the professors in the last uh, couple of days just to to confirm and clarify that position. 
Thank, thank you very much for that. Uh, Claire Baker as a supplementary. Thank you, convener. In terms of the delay to the census, I was wondering if there's an opportunity to speak to organisations who have been interested in the census. For example, the Veterans Community campaigned for the Count Me In campaign, and I understand that the collection of that information would be important to them in terms of planning services. Also, the delay will have an impact on some of this work. Were you able to have discussions with some of the stakeholders? Yeah, absolutely. We, we, we've started some of those conversations already. Uh, Pete, I don't know if you want to say anything in, in more detail, but I know we've, we've been engaging with uh, a number of veterans organisations uh, on this issue. Yep, thank you. <clears throat> yes, yeah, so when the decision was made, um, we wrote out to stakeholder, a number of the uh, stakeholders who we know had, had very specific um, interest in the census, as well as putting general information out through the website. So the veterans were sort of one of those groups that we're um, keen to engage with. It's also where the Office of Statistical Regulation regularly talks to us about, is about how are we engaging with those users who, who were expecting data to come through in March 22, and it's now going to be March 23. And so it's something that is absolutely part of our work as we go forward, and we will be talking with them and are very happy to engage um, with, with all of our stakeholders if they have any questions about what this means for how they use the data as it comes through at a Scottish level and a UK level. Thank you, Convener. Thank you very much. Uh, we have no other members indicating that they wish to ask supplementary questions. So we have completed our evidence session just ahead of time, a few minutes ahead of time uh, today, which I'm really pleased about, given that we were running a little bit late and it's quite a technical topic. Uh, so I'd like to take the opportunity to thank Mr Lowe, Mr Whitehouse, Ms Slater and Mr McQueen for their evidence today. The committee will consider the evidence heard in private shortly. And that concludes the public part of the meeting this morning. I will allow a couple of minutes for members to have a comfort break before we resume in private session. Thank you again to our witnesses. And I now uh, close the public part of the meeting. Thank you. <laughs>